There is no denying that psychological and emotional problems, even severe mental distress, can affect most anyone. But does this mean we are all insane? What causes psychological distress? Early psychiatrists thought it was an imbalance of the humors that could only be cured by bleeding patients with knives or leeches. Other psychiatrists believed mental problems came from organs like the tonsils, the stomach, and the spleen, and cut them out. Later were attempts to alter brain function, but these efforts also failed. Today, psychiatrists tell us that the way to fix unwanted behavior is by balancing brain chemistry with a pill. Did they get it right this time? They say you have a chemical imbalance of serotonin and dopamine, but there's never been a study to ever prove that, ever. It's just been indoctrinated into the culture and television advertising to the point where people now believe it is fact. Despite this lack of evidence, psychiatrists will tell you that psychotropic drugs are just like mainstream medical drugs. Can this be true? The answer is that unlike a drug such as insulin that corrects a measurable and proven imbalance in the body, psychotropic medications have no visible or measurable physical abnormality to correct. Here is evidence of a bacterial infection. Here is the psychiatric disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Here is a broken arm. Here is major depressive disorder. This is a brain tumor. And this is bipolar disorder. Which raises the question, how can you medicate something that is not physically there? The answer is, you can't. And furthermore, because psychotropic drugs are specifically designed to get past the body's natural defenses and into the brain, they can upset the very delicate processes the brain needs to ensure the body runs smoothly. Every time you throw something into the system that's foreign to the system, you're creating imbalances elsewhere within the system. The body changes as a result of taking the medication, so when you stop taking the medication, the body's got to change back to the way it was before, if it can, because it can't always. And in doing so, it disrupts the whole system. This is what creates the sometimes serious side effects. Paxil was the drug that gave me insomnia, I would cry very easily on it, and I completely lost my appetite within the first two days of taking it. It didn't help me study, it didn't help me do anything. I didn't even want to do work because I was so sick. Side meds didn't help me at all. They made matters, uh, I'd say, probably like 10 times worse for me, maybe even 20. Only now I was further impaired by the medications, and I started having car accidents. They put me on Zoloft, and it made me want to kill myself. And I realized that those drugs were just destroying me. Even when I was on them, I realized that they were destroying me. In spite of the crippling effects of their drugs, psychiatrists and drug companies have used them to create a huge and lucrative market worth billions. And they've done this by naming more and more of life's problems as medical disorders requiring psychiatric treatment. For example, shyness becomes social anxiety disorder, loss of a loved one, major depressive disorder, homesickness, separation anxiety, suspicion, paranoid personality disorder, having ups and downs, bipolar disorder, distractibility, ADHD. This is why it is almost impossible for anyone to see a psychiatrist today and not be diagnosed with a mental illness. And a diagnosis of mental illness means psychotropic drugs. When a patient goes into a psychiatrist's office and asks for help, probably 98, 99, maybe even 99.9% .9 of people are gonna receive a medication. And these medications have been estimated to cause over 700,000 serious adverse reactions a year and 42,000 deaths. Meanwhile, the psychiatric industry rakes in a third of a trillion dollars a year. The issue isn't whether or not people's emotional problems are real. They are. What we really should be asking is, how did psychiatrists convince people that these problems were signs of mental illness? How did they use these illnesses to create a demand by doctors and the public for psychotropic drugs? 
And how did these drugs, with no known curative powers and a long list of side effects, become the standard treatment for every problem in life? Psychiatrists assert that they have made much progress in the field of mental health over the past century and a half. To prove this, they claim a history of great advancements in the area of psychotropic drugs. But is this parade of brain chemicals the scientific breakthroughs they are leading us to believe? Modern institutional psychiatry has depended on psychotropic drugging since its earliest beginnings in insane asylums during the 19th century. During that period, psychiatrists functioned almost exclusively as attendants, promising to cure the seriously mentally ill. But as they could not, they were not regarded by mainstream medicine as real doctors. Other physicians considered psychiatrists as almost a doctor. Okay, because they weren't doing medical stuff. So to increase their status, they needed to become much more scientific. They need to prove that this is a legitimate scientific field. This is a legitimate medical profession. So they start medicalizing everything. To control behavioral outbursts amongst inmates, psychiatrists employed early psychotropic drugs, such as morphine and opium. But contrary to their claims, these drugs cured nothing and proved to be highly addictive. This led to a whole new generation of dependents, a solution far worse than the original problem. But the attempts to control objectionable behavior continued, and by the turn of the 20th century, phony cures for mental illness, such as heroin, could be found being peddled throughout the United States and Europe. Even psychologist Sigmund Freud played a major role in the creation of the cocaine industry in the Western world, writing many glowing articles promoting its use for spiritual distress and behavioral difficulties. Freud, as a psychoanalyst, uh, he, for a while, was promoting cocaine as being a panacea for all kinds of problems. Freud later wrote, the psychic effect of cocaine moriaticum consists of exhilaration and lasting euphoria, produced no compulsive desire to use the stimulant further. What Freud did not reveal was a significant conflict of interest involving two rival pharmaceutical giants, Merck and Park Davis, both paying him to endorse their respective cocaine extracts. Sigmund Freud's early psychotropic drug marketing campaign helped create a major cocaine epidemic throughout Europe at the turn of the century. Clearly, another happy pill would have to be found. It wouldn't take long. Psychiatrists in the first half of the 20th century next turned to amphetamines. As before, the hype subsided into unavoidable proof that the drugs not only were ineffective, but highly toxic and addictive. Each fad followed the same pattern. First, the drug would be hailed as a medical breakthrough for mental problems. Then, increasing reports of serious side effects would trickle in. Finally, after years of denial, when psychiatrists and pharmaceutical companies could no longer deny the dangers of the drug, they would abandon it in favor of their next wonder drug. Though none of their drug therapies had ever proven to cure anything, psychiatrists continued their search for a magic bullet that they supposed would cure all. And in 1954, their dream, they believed, was realized with the introduction of psychiatry's first so-called miracle drug, chlorpromazine, better known as Thorazine. Originally designed and tested as a synthetic dye, then as an antiparasitic in pigs, Thorazine was accidentally discovered to shut down human motor controls. One of the first papers promoting its psychiatric use stated, the aim is to produce a state of motor retardation, emotional indifference, and somnolence. Thorazine was considered the uh, uh, chemical lobotomy. Instead of cutting off the frontal lobes of the brain uh, with an ice pick, uh, you didn't have to do that kind of surgery. You, you could do it with a drug. 
Thorazine proved so lucrative in immobilizing patients exhibiting unwanted behavior that its maker, Smith, Klein & French, organized a major promotional campaign around the drug, including paying influential psychiatrists as speakers, organizing media campaigns, and even producing national television shows, a prelude to the mass drug marketing we see all around us today. Thorazine at that time was thought of as a miracle because it was able to reduce the symptoms of, of uh, psychosis and schizophrenia at that time that they knew about it. Um, and um, it emptied all of the um, psychiatric housing units. The campaign was wildly successful. Smith, Klein and French's income soared by over 500% in the following two decades, with Thorazine supplying over a third of the drug company's revenues in 1970. Eventually, an estimated 250 million people worldwide had been on Thorazine and drugs in its class, 23% more than the entire population of the United States. The floodgates had been opened. SKF and the psychiatrists on its payroll had proved that, through marketing, there could be big money in psychiatric drugs. But it wasn't long before Thorazine was revealed to have problems of its own. Thorazine chronically led to really serious problems such as tardive dyskinesia, which is a movement disorder that's very, very bothersome, and uh, supposedly it's irreversible. The tongue darting, you know, the, the muscle jerking, you know, the eyes rolling back in the head. Most people were sometimes permanently damaged by it, so they were going to have to live their life with uh, this neurological problem that was actually created by the pharmaceutical industry with their medication. Because Thorazine so hindered mental functioning, its use had to be limited to institutions. But with big money at stake, the race was on to discover a psychiatric drug that could be taken out of the institutions and into the hands of a much wider, vaster, and more lucrative market, the general public. Since they were emptying the institutions of all these psychotic patients with the advent of Thorazine, now they had to find different ways to treat people. So what better way than to go in the community and have an office and bring in uh, your everyday person or your executive under high stress or mama who's taking care of all the kids and they needed some way to create a therapy for them. In 1955, that drug was approved. Its name was Milltown, the first of the so-called minor tranquilizers. But to sell their new class of psychiatric drugs to the public, psychiatrists and drug companies first had to reposition them as working on a disease process, rather than just as sedating or restraining agents for undesirable human behaviors, as Thorazine had been. To do this, they began a marketing blitz on their colleagues, placing print advertisements in professional publications, such as the American Journal of Psychiatry. Prominent psychiatrists were then hired to spread the word to the rest of the medical field. Few knew that Nathan Klein, one of the most influential psychiatrists of his time, was being paid by the drug industry when he proclaimed that tranquilizers such as Milltown were equal in importance to the introduction of atomic energy, if not more so. Free samples were shipped to psychiatrists and physicians to get patients started on the drug. A year later, the marketing rollout hit the public, and Milltown soon became the first blockbuster psychiatric drug, not just for those incarcerated in an insane asylum, but for the mainstream public. Milltown was marketed to pregnant women, stay-at-home moms, and busy white-collar office workers, who called it Executive Excedrin. So it opened up a door for community-based mental health. Uh, whereby the psychiatrist could then have a role. So uh, they became very uh, closely associated with the pharmaceutical industry. And they were demanding as well to come up with better things for mom and pop and the executive and uh, the superstar uh, Hollywood actress or actor. And uh, soon, you know, it became a fashion to take some of these medications. By the 1960s, 36 million prescriptions for Milltown had been filled in the United States alone, accounting for $200 million in sales, 
an amount unheard of at that time for any psychiatric drug. Milltown's success led to the introduction of many more psychiatric drugs aimed at the general public throughout the 1950s and 60s. One such drug was Valium. Launched to the delirious acclaim of psychiatrists and the press, Valium was so widely prescribed to stressed out housewives that it even acquired a nickname, Mother's Little Helper. Lost amidst this hoopla was strong and well-documented early evidence that tranquilizers also came with serious, life-changing side effects. Milltown, for example, was soon labeled by the 1962 President's Advisory Commission on Narcotic and Drug Abuse as more dangerous and addictive even than cocaine or methamphetamine and fell quickly out of use. But the psychiatric community ignored these warnings. Pandora's box had been opened, and with their new pills, they were no longer caretakers of the insane. They were real doctors, administering drugs to patients. And their backward logic was, if the drugs did indeed shut down mental symptoms, weren't they therefore addressing some physical disease in the brain? Within years, this reasoning enabled psychiatry to undergo a profound change. Psychiatrists were no longer caretakers, they were doctors. Mental complaints were no longer psychological, they were symptoms of disease. And to treat them, psychiatrists wrote them prescriptions. It's all about money. The use of uh, writing prescriptions and uh, having an income from people coming in and getting their prescriptions and this, that, and the other is what uh, revived the psychiatric community. It was the thing that put them back where they were earning money again. Business was going so well that a group of prominent psychiatrists met in Puerto Rico in 1967 to lay out the expansion of psychotropic drug use for the year 2000. According to organizing psychiatrist Dr. Wayne O. Evans, Psychomedication is now an accepted way of life, and the search for the just right pill has become the goal for many people. By the early 1980s, Valium had become the most widely prescribed drug of any kind in the Western world. In 1978 alone, nearly 2.3 billion tablets sold, enough to medicate one half of the world population. The business of psychotropic drugging had gotten so out of hand that at a 1979 hearing on the use and abuse of benzodiazepines, one United States senator commented that. The whole pitch appears to be to, to sell, market, sell, and market. But bigger things were yet to come. The next drug that became a rage was Prozac. And of course, Prozac was not for anxiety, but for depression. And all of a sudden, the, the diagnosis of depression uh, starts uh, multiply. The, the number of people who are diagnosed as being depressed starts multiplying substantially. Prozac was released amid great fanfare with tales of miraculous recoveries, sick minds made well, and ruined lives restored, and all with almost no side effects or addiction, or so its manufacturer claimed. Many new antidepressants quickly followed, also pitching instant psychological relief with little downside. And with this, mainstream psychiatry abandoned psychotherapy for pharmacology forever. In a bold and effective marketing coup, the world was told that these new antidepressant drugs were not just for the depressed, but lifestyle drugs for a choose-your-mood society. But almost immediately, evidence emerged that claims of universal safety and effectiveness were far from the truth. The adverse side effects of this class of drugs includes things like sexual dysfunction, agitation, uh, facial uh, involuntary movements of the face. Uh, some of the psychiatrists in their books describe the tongue darting in and out of the mouth as an adverse side effect of SSRI drugs. Within 10 years, staggering details of side effects such as violence and suicide could no longer be ignored, with an estimated 3.9 million adverse events on Prozac alone. Black box warnings alerting the public to significant risks of violence and suicide were issued once again against loud protests from drug companies and organized psychiatry. But when the patents of antidepressants expired, 
Just as predictably, psychiatrists and drug makers finally admitted the truth. But now they claimed, here was a new scientific breakthrough that would change everything. A new class of drugs called the atypical antipsychotic. Newly approved to treat both schizophrenia and a then obscure mental disorder dubbed bipolar disorder. Suddenly, the diagnosis of bipolar disorder became the rage, with diagnosis rates soaring by thousands of percentage points in a matter of years. What is clear is that the patents run out and uh, the drug companies are always looking to maximize their profits, so they uh, research new drugs and they can keep them patented for about 17 years and charge monopoly prices. And then when the patent wears off, uh, often the next one comes along. Soon, however, atypical antipsychotics, like all their predecessors, were revealed as having crippling and even deadly side effects, such as obesity, diabetes, and even heart problems, along with questionable efficacy and almost certain dependency. Pharmaceutical companies are trying to get away from the old style Thorazines and into the new uh, antipsychotics, and we know that they're no better. So today's new an improved antipsychotic is no better than the old Thorazine, which was the miracle drug for psychiatry. Today, the same cycle continues with breathless news coverage of new chemical treatments promoted as breakthroughs. Even hallucinogens such as LSD and ecstasy are now being tested for future psychiatric prescription. Psychiatry has a wonderful history of coming up with one label after another all to cover up their own inadequacies and their own inability to get a product, which means to cure somebody or to truly honestly help somebody. So their solution is always, let's come up with another syndrome that that person has. It's one alphabet soup label after another. And just when the public starts catching on to that the experts may be telling us a story, we move on to the next realm of drugs. Psychiatry has become basically pharmaceutical management in America. That's what psychiatrists do. If you went to a surgeon, you would expect to get cut. If you go to psychiatrists, you expect to get medicated. That's what psychiatrists do. A century and a half later, two questions remain. Where is the science that backs psychiatry up? And how long will the public continue to be fooled by false hopes, hype, and outright lies? Psychiatrists have long desired to be viewed on a par with medical professionals. But whereas regular physicians have diagnostic tests to prove or disprove illness, psychiatrists do not. There is no objective testing in psychiatry. There is no blood test. There is no urine test. There is no biopsy. There's nothing that objectively proves that there's anything physiologically or biochemically wrong that's creating your symptoms. With cancer, you can do a screening and it's there or not. You can look at the cells and you can tell if it's there. Uh, different diseases, you can, you can look at it and you can see it under a microscope, or you can see it in an MRI, or you can see it in a CAT scan. With mental health, you can't see it. You can't be diagnosed in a medical procedure. It's all subjective. So the question becomes, Without any scientific lab tests showing the presence or absence of mental problems, how does psychiatry's diagnostic system work? And how did it become so prevalent? Psychiatry's search for scientific grounding has been going on for well over a century. In the late 19th century, German psychiatrist Emil Kreplin was the first to attempt to classify mental problems as medical disease states. Though he devoted his life attempting to prove that these problems came exclusively from biological and hereditary sources, he never could, finally concluding it was nearly impossible to scientifically distinguish the normal from the insane. In spite of Kreplin's findings, psychiatrists persisted with many efforts at classification throughout the years, resulting in the first edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 
published by the American Psychiatric Association in 1952. A small, spiral-bound, 130-page handbook, DSM-1 described 112 so-called mental disorders based not on standard scientific procedure, but contributions from a write-in ballot mailed to 10% of the APA's member psychiatrists. With the release of its second edition in 1968, the DSM had now grown to 145 disorders, still not based on any science, though packed with theories on the origins of its illnesses. But with the sudden surge in popularity of psychiatric drugs such as Milltown and Valium among the general public, the psychiatric community realized that a biological explanation to justify prescribing them had to be found. And they found it in a paper written by psychiatrist Dr. Joseph Schildkraut. Though he had no means of discovering what normal brain chemistry should consist of, Schildkraut theorized that mental problems might be caused by a biochemical imbalance of neurotransmitters in the brain. It's a great line, the chemical imbalance. Um, there's no evidence for it. There, there is no way you can measure or document that such a thing occurs uh, in the first place. There are no lab tests to see what your neurotransmitter levels are or how much you need and, and how off your balance is. Chemical imbalance sounds good, sounds scientific, but whereas, you know, there, as, as we know, there's, there isn't any way to measure what the balance is. There is no identifiable chemical imbalance in the human brain other than the chemical imbalance that comes from putting a medication in that brain. And um, so we've been sold that there's a chemical imbalance, but there's no science to back that up. Though Schildkraut was never able to prove his chemical imbalance theory, it was too late. The psychiatric community had already adopted the theory as a plausible sounding medical explanation for the mental disorders listed in the DSM. But without a test confirming a chemical imbalance, psychiatrists were still bedeviled by a severe inconsistency of diagnosis. Not only that, but psychiatrists were often unable to tell the sane from the insane. This point was driven home in 1972 in the famous Rosenhan experiment where a total of eight perfectly healthy volunteers each presented themselves at a mental institution, claiming to hear voices in their head that only said the words empty, hollow, or thud. No other psychiatric symptoms were stated. The result, each of the volunteers, including Dr. David Rosenhan himself, was immediately committed into the institution. The moment we were admitted to the hospital, we abandoned our symptom and we behave the way we usually behave. The question was, would anyone detect that we were sane? The answer was, no, no one ever did. All but one was diagnosed as schizophrenic. They were only discharged after admitting they were indeed mentally ill and in remission. After learning of the experiment, the psychiatric community was furious. One hospital challenged Rosenhan to send in more volunteers, promising to catch every one of the fake patients. Three months later, they proudly announced that of 193 patients presenting themselves, they had turned away over 41 who were pretending mental illness and considered another 42 suspect. The problem was Dr. Rosenhan hadn't sent in a single person. 70 years later, Emil Kreplin's conclusion that psychiatry could not distinguish sanity from insanity had once again been proven correct. In his study, Rosenhan concluded, any diagnostic process that lends itself too readily to massive errors of this sort cannot be a very reliable one. It wasn't just the embarrassment of the Rosenhan experiment that caused psychiatry's leadership to take a new approach to diagnosis. With the rapid expansion in the psychotropic drug business, psychiatry underwent a seismic shift in the way it promoted mental illness. And the third edition of the DSM, spearheaded by psychiatrist Dr. Robert Spitzer, took a decidedly brain-based biological approach. Unlike its predecessors, the proposed DSM-3 assumed that mental problems derived from physical abnormalities of the brain. And instead of describing possible psychological causes for mental distress, 
DSM-3 would simply provide clinicians with checklists of symptoms. However, these descriptions were broad enough to apply to anyone at any time of life. With no science to back them up, these newly proposed disorders and the checklists that went with them were subject to intense negotiation, compromise, alteration, and heated debate. Psychiatrist David Schaffer, who attended the DSM-3 conference, observed, People would shout out their opinions from all sides of the room, and whoever shouted loudest tended to be heard. My own impression is, coming straight from England was, it was more like a tobacco auction than a sort of conference. Many committees are established to determine what should and shouldn't go into the DSM, uh, the current revision. And a lot of the committee activity is based upon, could be personal bias, political pressure, uh, the trend that may be in vogue then, and other things that are non-medical. Well, in the DSM, I mean, they vote in diseases. I mean, they, they get together, the panel, psychiatrists, look and decide, is this a disease or is this not a disease? How many of you agree this should be a disease? They have a show of hands. They said to 20 people in the room, 12 vote for it, 8 vote against it, bingo. They have a disease. Tell me that that's science. One psychologist reported that during discussions of the proposed criteria for masochistic personality disorder, Spitzer's wife protested about one symptom of the disorder, to which Spitzer responded, okay, take it out. Scientific or not, once a disorder is voted into the DSM, it is very hard to vote it out. On rare occasions, however, this too has occurred. Homosexuality, a mental illness according to DSM 1 and 2. After gay rights activists picketed their 1973 convention, the American Psychiatric Association buckled to political pressure and decided by a mail-in ballot of its member psychiatrists to remove it from DSM's next edition. What happened? It wasn't like, you know, there's some objective evidence that, that at one point it was a disease and we cured the disease and that's a lifestyle choice. No, it was cultural. You know, we became more liberal in this country and decided, okay, it's fine. Whereas, you know, 50, 100 years ago, it wasn't fine, it was a problem. But you, that's not medicine, that's something else. And the psychiatrists who wrote the DSM-3 knew it, as Robert Spitzer would admit to the BBC many years later. What happened is that we made uh, estimates of prevalence of mental disorders totally descriptively, which out consi without considering that many of these conditions might be normal reactions, which are not really disorders. That, that's the problem. But instead of learning from their mistakes, the American Psychiatric Association published the DSM-IV in 1994. And it was even bigger. With 374 different diagnoses amongst its 886 pages, the new edition more than tripled the number of mental illnesses listed in the DSM-1. This rapid expansion in the number of psychiatric diagnoses may not help the patient, but it benefits many others. Once a diagnosis has been created, it enters the professional curricula. Specialists emerge to treat it. Conferences are organized around it. Research and publications cover it. Psychiatrists formulate their patient's symptoms to correspond to it. And drugs are prescribed for it. The DSM, in short, was no longer a manual, but a full-fledged industry. The DSM, although it is our Bible, it becomes the Bible and it becomes a tantamount to, uh, you know, the tablet coming down from Mount Sinai, not just for psych psychiatry and psychology, but for insurance companies, for the legal profession. It comes into play as far as uh, sentencing. It comes into play as far as custody decisions. So non-scientific information is used to make some radical life-altering or life-ending decisions. The danger of all these psychiatric diseases is that anyone walking the earth today could be labeled as having a mental illness. Using the DSM, psychiatrists at Harvard University have declared that half of everyone on earth will be mentally ill in their lifetime. One prominent Harvard psychiatrist, Dr. John Rady, goes a step further 
arguing no one is truly normal. Though the American Psychiatric Association has quietly acknowledged the lack of evidence for Joseph Schildkraut's chemical imbalance theory, the claim is still flogged in the media and passed on to patients every day. And although you are not likely to hear it in the general media, psychiatrists readily admit that the disorders listed in the DSM have no proven pathology and therefore cannot be called medical diseases. If you were to be confronted with someone saying that the DSM is not backed up by science, what do you have to say about that? Oh, I would say that they're entirely right. No, the DSM is not science. I think there are non-scientific elements, political aspects of it that influence it. Yeah, absolutely. DSM-4 is still far away from science. The DSM system is far from perfect, but it's the best we have. DSM stands for diagnosis as a source of money. It brings in a lot of money. Nonetheless, the next edition, DSM-5, is in the planning stages and is due to be published in 2012. And this time, the negotiation for the next new psychiatric diseases is being held in secret. But we do know some of the new disorders under consideration. One is Internet Addiction Disorder, originally presented as a joke in a 1997 New Yorker article. Regardless, it is now claimed that 25 million people may qualify as compulsive surfers. Other disorders contemplated for DSM-5 include compulsive shopping disorder, binge eating, apathy disorder, parental alienation syndrome, relational disorder, intermittent explosive disorder, road rage, all potential disease categories with psychotropic drugs waiting to be assigned to them. According to the APA, 19 of the 27 psychiatrists on the top panel deciding on what illnesses to include in the next edition of the DSM have financial ties to drug companies. The situation got so bad that the architect of DSM-3, Robert Spitzer, and DSM-4 editor, Alan Francis, went public, warning, the APA might well be accused of a conflict of interest in fashioning DSM-5 to create new patients for psychiatrists and new customers for pharmaceutical companies. But the psychiatric community has decided not to address this issue, and for good reason. Today, psychiatric drugging rakes in over $80 billion a year for pharmaceutical companies. And with every new edition of the DSM, the diagnoses have not only expanded in number, but cast a wider net to encompass such population segments as senior citizens, the military, pregnant women, and even children. In my training, when I first started this, they told us that they would not give a bipolar diagnosis for a child under 18. Um, these days, I see children diagnosed with bipolar disorder at five and six years old. A two-year-old can be throwing a temper tantrum and then stop and be fine. Anybody that's a parent has seen that happen. That doesn't mean they're mentally ill. It means they're two-year-olds. How can you even diagnose a two-year-old as a bipolar disorder? I mean, how can you diagnose anybody as a bipolar disorder if you want to look at it that way? Because there is no such thing as bipolar disorder, not from a medical standpoint. It's not like you can find a cell in a person that shows that they have bipolar disorder. It's not like they have a fever or run a temperature, like if they had a physical illness. This is a behavioral definition only. In other words, a human being sat there and made a subjective decision that this person has this so-called condition. Today, nearly one million children are diagnosed as bipolar, making it more common than autism and diabetes combined. In 2007, half a million children and teenagers took at least one prescription for an antipsychotic, including 20,000 under the age of six. Antipsychotic drugs, powerful chemicals designed originally for only the most seriously mentally troubled, are now a $22.8 billion industry. If you spent days reading the newest DSM, you would be able to diagnose every human being that you ever saw. And with the diagnosis comes the treatment. The DSM most definitely helps in the prescribing of drugs. It, it, uh, legitimizes the process of pulling out the prescription pad. 
because here is this disease entity. The disease entity is addressed with this medication. And the DSM is in the service of making things reductionist into very simple, uh, simplistic ways of looking at things. That makes it easier for the pharmaceutical company to create a medication for. Uh, the only thing that we've left out of that equation is the person. And the average person is completely unaware that psychiatric diagnoses are not medical, but merely voted on behaviors. Which leads us to our next question. How do psychiatrists take these invented disorders and get people to believe they have them? According to psychiatrists at the World Health Organization, 450 million people worldwide have a mental disorder. Three times the metropolitan populations of Tokyo, New York, Los Angeles, London, Paris, Mexico City, Mumbai, Milano, Madrid, Toronto, Washington, Athens, Melbourne, Hong Kong, Singapore, Rome, and Berlin combined. Are there really this many mentally ill? Or is this just a case of good marketing? In early 1999, the United States was confronted with news of a frightening new disease epidemic. You blush, sweat, shake, even find it hard to breathe, posters read. With the tagline, imagine being allergic to people. The disease was social anxiety disorder, SAD, or SAD, and it was claimed to affect about 13.3% of the American population. And to find out more, readers were instructed to contact a group called the Social Anxiety Disorder Coalition. What the public was not told was that both the coalition and the campaign were created by a public relations agency and bankrolled by a drug company. Later that year, while the campaign was making millions of people aware of this previously unknown disease, the antidepressant Paxil became the first drug approved by the FDA for the treatment of social anxiety disorder. Psychiatrists such as Jack Gorman of Columbia University and Murray Stein of the University of California at San Diego signed up as psychiatric frontmen for Paxil's ad campaign. And within three years, Paxil shot from third place in its drug class to first. Paxil's product director would later boast, every marketer's dream is to find an unidentified or unknown market and develop it. That's what we were able to do with social anxiety disorder. Paxil's competition took notice. That same year, Pfizer got FDA approval to sell its antidepressant, Zoloft, for treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. They too hired a public relations firm to create their own psychiatric front group and paid psychiatrists to spread the word about the disorder. This campaign would claim that one person in 13 would develop PTSD over the course of a lifetime. And this included anyone witnessing a violent act, natural disaster, or distressing event. And as with Paxil, sales of Zoloft skyrocketed. For the psychiatric drugs, the goal is to have as many people on them as possible. So the, the way to do that is to convince normal people that they have some defect or mental disease or condition that requires treatment. So, I mean, that's, that is, is just, that's the way they do it. They hire these big marketing companies that come up with these campaigns. We're going to tell you about your disease so that you can lead a happier, healthier life. Oh, and by the way, we have a drug too that helps to treat this disease. This practice of selling sickness is known as disease mongering, a term defined by the late journalist Lynn Payer as trying to convince essentially well people that they are sick or slightly sick people that they are very ill. On Madison Avenue, disease mongering is accomplished through a strategy known as condition branding, where mental illness is pitched just like cars, beer, or laundry detergent. And according to top New York branding guru, Vince Parry, no therapeutic category is more accepting of condition branding than the field of anxiety and depression where illness is rarely based on measurable physical symptoms and therefore open to conceptual definition. Perry then suggests to executives three principal strategies for what he called fostering the creation of psychiatric illness. The first is elevating the importance of a condition, 
or leading the public to believe that a minor or temporary mental problem is much worse and far more widespread than it really is. Prior to the introduction of SSRI antidepressants, depression was considered, even by psychiatrists, to affect only 100 people per million. Since then, estimates have been raised to as many as 100,000 cases per million, a 1,000-fold increase. The result is about 10% of Americans, some 27 million people, currently on antidepressants, twice as many as in 1996. We're very good marketing that all, you know, expressions of human emotion, deep, deep sadness and fear and anger and whatever else they happen to be, are, are now classified as, you know, a, a major problem, a psychiatric problem, a psychological problem that needs to be dealt with with drugs. Another psychiatric illness, bipolar disorder, was also considered rare, affecting only one-tenth of one percent when it was first introduced in the DSM-3. Today, there are claims that as many as 10% of the population, a hundred times the original number, have the condition. Pediatric bipolar disorder was not even listed in the DSM when Harvard psychiatrist Dr. Joseph Biederman began publishing studies claiming that mood swings in children were not normal behaviors, but in reality, mental illnesses. Biederman's disease-mongering campaign worked. In the last decade alone, the rate of children labeled with bipolar has soared 4,000 percent. But what parents were not told was that 25 different drug companies had underwritten Dr. Biederman's work. The extent of their influence was not revealed until a 2008 Senate investigation exposed Dr. Biederman for failing to report more than $1.6 million in pharmaceutical income. But these revelations had no effect on psychiatry. Pediatric bipolar continues to be widely accepted in the psychiatric community. These labels are being applied to younger and younger children, which I think is really, um, you know, a sad case. I'm not sure I agree with any of those labels to begin with, but let alone for them to be applied universally to young kids. This idea that kids, that childhood itself is a psychiatric disease, is simply based off some completely um, unsubstantiated idea that got printed in the psychiatric manual and there's no science behind it whatsoever. Disease mongering strategy number two, redefining an existing condition. This tactic takes an ordinary state of mind and recasts it as a psychiatric disease that now must be treated with drugs. Case in point, the winter blues, a common mental condition related to the lack of sunlight during winter months but redefined by psychiatrists as seasonal affective disorder, a psychiatric disease requiring psychiatric treatment. As another example, consider the changing emotions during a woman's menstruation, made over by psychiatrists as premenstrual dysphoric disorder, a mental illness discovered not in a laboratory, but in the marketing department of drug maker Eli Lilly. When Prozac patent came up, they realized they needed to come up with some sort of new to keep the money rolling in, and they came up with, uh, with a new disorder. They just made it out of thin air, you know, the premenstrual dysphoric disorder, the PMDD, and then the new wonder drug, which was Seraphem, which if you look at Seraphem on the back of the label, it just says, this is Prozac. And they were able to keep that patent so that nobody else could make it, so that they could keep that money rolling in. Many of the drugs today are simply drugs repackaged. They're drugs that um, had a patent and now are generic or now get get called something else or they, they decide now to use them for something else. Disease-mongering strategy number three, creating a new condition for an unmet market need. Example, compulsive shopping disorder, publicized by psychiatrist Dr. Jack Gorman. In Gorman's public appearances, a recent study was cited that claimed that as many as 20 million Americans, 90% of them women, could have the problem. What he did not reveal was that the study was funded by Forest Laboratories, maker of the antidepressant Celexa, and that he was a paid consultant to at least 13 pharmaceutical firms, Forest included. Most consumers have never heard of the concept of marketing of disease for profit, but to those in the advertising and drug industries, it is well known. 
A 2005 Reuters Business Insight report, written for drug company executives, notes that the ability to create new disease markets is bringing untold billions in soaring drug sales, and that the coming years will bear greater witness to the corporate-sponsored creation of disease. If I can't get along with my husband, take a drug. If I'm feeling a little depressed, take a drug. If I can't study properly, take a drug. We've become a fast food, what I call a fast food, fast drug society. One might then ask, is anyone questioning this rampant increase in extremely questionable and scientifically unproven mental diagnoses? In April 2006, the British Medical Journal inadvertently found out when they published a groundbreaking study announcing a newly discovered psychiatric disease, Motivational Deficiency Disorder, or MODED. Characterized by lethargy and an unwillingness to work, MODED was claimed to affect millions. But when media outlets around the world uncritically broadcast the news, the journal told the truth. The study was part of their April Fool's Day edition. But the joke made its point. Disease mongering works. Even people without any mental illness at all can be deemed at risk and recommended drug treatment. One study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association urged all stroke victims to take an antidepressant to prevent depression, whether they were depressed or not. It was later discovered that its authors had an undisclosed financial relationship with the maker of the antidepressant, Lexapro. Preventive drugging is the wave of the future. As one expert noted, there is an apparently limitless amount of money to be made from marketing pharmaceutical remedies for diseases and even more from remedies to reduce risk factors for disease. And of course, every time they come out with a new mental disorder, then they come out with a new drug to counteract it. Uh, at least to me, it seems like nothing more than a marketing ploy. There are certain executives in the pharmaceutical manufacturers that have stated that one day in America, every person will be on drugs, healthy or not. With these clever disease-mongering campaigns, 100 million people worldwide are currently on psychotropic drugs. And as a result, the psychotropic drug industry is grossing over $150,000 every minute. Observed one consumer advocate, you can sell hundreds of millions of dollars worth of a drug, even a bad drug, if you have the right marketing campaign. Which leads us to our next question. Now that disease-mongering campaigns are creating the illusion of widespread mental illness, how safe are the drugs psychiatrists are prescribing to treat it? In modern psychiatry, psychotropic drugs have become the weapons of choice. But are they as safe as we've been led to believe? International regulatory bodies, such as the United States Food and Drug Administration, require that all drugs be proven safe and effective before they can be released. To accomplish this, pharmaceutical companies must conduct thorough and exacting clinical trials that prove the safety and efficacy of their drugs prior to marketing. At least, that's what's supposed to happen. But underneath the public relations veneer, claims of psychotropic drug safety by psychiatrists and drug companies are far from the truth. And there are many reasons why. To begin with, drug safety testing is predominantly done by drug companies, not by governmental agencies or independent laboratories, creating an obvious conflict of interest. They pay for it, they, they bring in the researchers, they have every opportunity to skew the research, to to manipulate it to produce exactly what they want it to produce. The first step in submitting an application for a psychotropic drug is to find a disorder in psychiatry's diagnostic and statistical manual and attach it to the drug. Then clinical trials begin, first on animals, then on humans. If the drug makes it to human testing, clinical trials then follow four phases. In phase one, it is tested on a very small number of volunteers, usually healthy young subjects, to determine if the drug is not overly toxic and what side effects it carries. 
and the studies that are done have young men or women that have very little body fat and are healthy in their 20s. They don't test these drugs on elderly people that have a huge amount of body fat or different proportion of body fat and they hold their, their the reaction of their drugs is totally different, but they don't ever consider that. In phase two, psychiatric researchers determine if the drug creates the sought after effects on the human body and how large a dose can be given before drug toxicity sets in. As in phase one, test subjects are mostly healthy young volunteers. So just the people that I already know are gonna perform well on my drug are gonna be entered in this trial. Well, how well do you think your drug's gonna come out? Phase three testing compares the psychotropic drug against a placebo or sugar pill. Although phase three testing is larger and more extensive than phases one or two, it normally involves only about a thousand patients and lasts a mere four to eight weeks, certainly not enough time to determine any long-term side effects. Today, clinical research is a profit-driven multinational industry where drug companies and psychiatric researchers are involved in every detail, from study design to data analysis to study publication. But in doing their trials, psychiatrists face a problem the rest of the medical field does not. They have no scientific lab tests to objectively measure improvement. On a clinical trial for, say, a drug for cancer or for high cholesterol, it's easy to see if something is working because you can look at the study result. The cholesterol level is dropped or the cancer is shrunk or the cancer cells are going away or there are less of them. You can physically see the answer. With mental health issues, you don't have that luxury. It is this lack of science that permits psychiatric drug researchers many opportunities to skew results of drug trials in the pharmaceutical company's favor. One of the ones I think that is most important is the placebo washout. Um, and what that is is basically that they give people placebo pill, you know, uh, the sugar pill, and then anybody who says that they feel better, they get rid of them. And, and so in which case, they already skew the sample of people being included into the study. Um, that's gonna stack the cards against um, the placebo, and it's going to show an artificial greater effect for the drug. The data shows that the people that got placebo did better. And you know what the researchers said? Oh, that's the placebo effect. Well, we want to get those people out of the study. Another trick of the trade involves giving subjects the test drugs prior to the trial and then putting them in withdrawal. Then after starting the trial, they are put back on the test drug and will either come out of withdrawal and score better, or if on a placebo, will continue to feel worse. Psychiatrist Richard Borison, for example, took schizophrenics off Haldol to generate active psychosis, then put them back on Haldol during the trial. In spite of this, his study is still cited in psychiatric literature. Another way that they can manipulate the data is unweighted distributions. Um, I have three studies that I look at. One study has a thousand people in it, and another one has ten people in it, and another one has uh, you know, 15 people in it. The 1,000 person study showed that the drug was no benefit at all. But the two other studies that only had 10 and 15 people in it showed the drugs were incredibly superior. So what do they say? They say two out of three studies showed greater benefit to the drug group. Perhaps the most common way of tilting the outcome of a clinical trial is simply not to count the individuals dropping out of the study because of the side effects. In fact, in clinical trials for the antipsychotic Zyprexa, two-thirds of the 2,500 participants had so many side effects, they dropped out. Of the remaining 800, 22% reported serious adverse reactions to the drug. And during the Prozac approval trials, of the 11,000 patients tested, only 286, less than 3%, actually completed the short four to six week trials. In another common practice, adverse side effects are covered up by giving additional drugs that are not part of the study. And some researchers have been known to simply falsify the studies. Case in point, psychiatrist Farouk Abuzahab, former ethics committee chair of the Minnesota Psychiatry Society, whose patient he recruited into one of his clinical trials, reported having extreme thoughts of suicide. 
In his research documents, however, he noted zero adverse events. Two days later, she jumped from a Minneapolis bridge to her death. A final way of skewing test data is to hide unwanted drug reactions under less frightening terms. This trick was used in the notorious Paxil study 329, where such side effects as aggressive events, homicidal thoughts, and homicidal acts were categorized under the word hostility, while under the nebulous term emotional lability were filed suicidal thoughts and actions. In many cases, clinical trials are set up not to look for violence and suicide at all. It is a, a problem that if these clinical trials don't specifically really ask a lot of questions about the nature of suicidal ideation and how the person feels and hopelessness and, and akesthesia, if they don't ask those questions very specifically, um, they're not going to really get that data and it's not going to come up. Designing biased trials to avoid negative findings, interpreting the raw data to favor your drug, and spinning the entire study to accentuate the positive are just some of the many, many ways to bias a trial. It is this perfect storm of intellectual dishonesty that has led one drug expert to conclude that it can be proven that most claimed research findings are false. But it is the drug companies that own the studies and when they believe they have compiled enough evidence to convince regulators that their drug is safe and effective, they submit their phase three clinical trials for approval. The FDA only requires that two clinical trials be submitted, so drug companies can conduct as many studies as it takes to find the two that have the best chance at FDA approval. You only need two positive trials against placebo. And it doesn't matter if you did a thousand, as long as you get two. And it's amazing, sometimes they actually don't. Uh, they might pull data from another couple of clinical trials in order to get that approved. They don't need to report all their data. They don't need to report all the trials that they do. They only need to report the ones that they want. They can hand pick whichever one they want and then submit just those couple to the FDA. As FDA Director of the Division of Neuropharmacological Drug Products, psychiatrist Paul Lieber complained, the sponsor could just do studies until the cows come home, until he gets two of them that are statistically significant by chance alone, walks them out, and says he had met the criteria. The New England Journal published a study about a year ago showing that uh, many clinical trials that had been conducted and registered with the Food and Drug Administration were never published because they came out showing no significant advantage over placebo. So uh, antidepressants are not as effective as they are being made out to be, and the side effects are uh, not as emphasized as much as they should be. This point was driven home in 2008 by psychologist Irving Kirsch and his colleagues, who obtained every clinical trial ever submitted published and unpublished from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration of four new generation antidepressants. The results were both alarming and enlightening. In Kirsch's words, antidepressant medications have reported only modest benefits over placebo treatment. And when unpublished trial data are included, the benefit falls below accepted criteria for clinical significance. In addition to this, volumes of effects associated with these antidepressants have since been discovered, including homicide, suicide, and mass murder. People really don't realize that from the beginning there's been a question of how marginal, marginally efficacious these drugs really are apart from placebo. And yet we have horrific side effects. Combine the two and where's your risk to benefit ratio? It's down the toilet. But psychiatrists dismiss Kirsch's study because psychotropic drugs are big business and clinical trials are a big part of that business. Take, for example, Martin Keller, former chair of the psychiatry department at Brown University, lead author of the so-called Paxil 329 study. This clinical trial, which tested hundreds of children on the antidepressant Paxil, found that the drug was generally well-tolerated and effective which in scientific terms is glowing praise. And the study's list of co-authors, 22 of the most prominent key opinion leaders in psychiatry. I mean, that was a lot of people, but they were the who's who 
of psychiatry and this was going to be a publication that I think you know took them you know the into the end zone on getting their approval for kids with the FDA's blessing Paxil became a blockbuster in the child and adolescent market with sales of 55 million dollars in 2002 it wasn't until the New York State Attorney General's office sued in 2004 that the truth finally came out the raw data showed that not only was Paxil no more effective than placebo, but the young patients on Paxil were six times more likely to have suicidal thoughts. In fact, this data also revealed that 11 of the 93 children on the study developed serious side effects, of whom seven had to be hospitalized. But according to Keller's own administrator, many of those children were either dropped from the study or coded as non-compliant to avoid having to be counted. While admitting no guilt, the drug company settled out of court for $2.5 million, less money than Paxil was grossing every seven hours. Hundreds of civil suits followed, but when Dr. Keller, as lead author of the Paxil 329 study, was deposed by attorneys, he would not admit to much. I can't remember exactly what I said. I, I don't remember anything specific about any of these meetings. If my name wasn't on the top, I wouldn't remember ever having seen it. If I saw them, I don't remember. The answer is, I don't remember. I don't recall if I was. I don't recall asking him, which isn't to say that I didn't. I want to pick up on the uh, question Mr. Coffin asked you about the five-fold increase of the Paxil kids uh, experiencing suicidality over the placebo kids. Do you recall those questions? I do. And you said that you weren't, you weren't particularly aware of that except for with regard to a manuscript that was sent to you in confidence by GSK? Correct. That, that actually is not correct, though. I mean, you actually, this was an issue that had been presented to you by a number of different reporters that you personally responded to. Is that correct? Yes. Um, I don't remember. How could Dr. Keller have known so little about the drug study of which he was lead author and which he himself used to promote Paxil for children in prominent medical journals and conferences? The ultimate publication of, of Study 329 was ghostwritten by an agency hired by GlaxoSmithKline, and um, eventually, they, uh, after the manuscript was written, uh, they put Martin Keller's name on it as an author. You know, there again, and maybe you can tell me where I can find it in the paper. No, I'm asking you if you were aware. I, I don't remember the specifics. And then we finally showed him a document from GlaxoSmithKline where GlaxoSmithKline says that the study was entirely flawed. It was a complete failed study, and it certainly didn't show that Paxil was remarkably efficacious for treating children and adolescents in depression. Can you read that into the record, please? Essentially, the study did not really show Paxil was effective in treating adolescent depression, comma, which is not something we want to publicize. We asked him, with that information now, you know, how can you s tell us that it would be okay and safe to give a kid Paxil? And he couldn't answer the question. He, he sat back, he put his he head in his hands, and for, you know, the longest two minutes sat there silent. During the last two years of his Paxil study, Keller personally pocketed a million dollars in drug company money, none of which he disclosed in his published research. When people look at uh, the field of psychiatry and they hear all these reports in the New York Times and Boston Globe and, and they see this psychiatrist or this psychologist, you know, uh, took money and didn't disclose it. Um, and. Uh, they wonder, well, is this causing a biases, you know, in the field? I think that's a legitimate concern of the public because of the fact that it is true. With this level of corruption pervading the testing of psychotropic drugs, one is left with the question, where are those who are entrusted with our protection? Government regulators are supposed to watch out for patients' welfare. So why are so many dangerous psychotropic drugs being allowed on the market? Okay. 
At one point, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration was considered the gold standard in drug safety. But this is no longer the case with psychotropic drugs, where psychiatrists and drug companies have virtually taken over the approval process. FDA drug advisory panels that recommend the approval of psychotropic drugs have long been filled with psychiatrists with financial ties to drug companies. One study showed that 92% of FDA advisory meetings in the last decade included at least one member with conflicts of interest. In response to the accusation of conflict of interest, the FDA says that they have tried to find mental health experts without drug industry connections, but can't locate any. To solve this, they issue waivers, where a psychiatrist is allowed to sit on a psychotropic drug advisory panel, despite having a financial conflict of interest of up to $50,000 a year with drug companies. The advisory panels that review drugs, most of these people are direct recipients of money from uh, usually the, the, the drug under study, the company that's submitting the drug, and they waive the conflicts most of the time. So it, it's really, it's pretty pervasive and it's quite insidious. insidious. Full waivers have been granted to the following participants. Dr. Andrew Leon for his role as a member for, for, of a data safety monitoring board for an affected firm. He receives between $10,001 and $50,000 per year. Dr. Bruce Pollock has been granted a limited waiver for his activities on an advisory board and speakers bureau for an affected firm in which he receives less than $10,001 per year. Ms. Jean Bronstein for her ownership of stock and a bond in an affected firm in which, she val in which the value falls between $50,001 and $100,000. You could be paid massive amounts of money by the drug companies, you know, in this sense, and then turn your head here and say, okay, now I'm going to review the drug. And that huge conflict of interest was not to be discussed. In fact, they didn't want people putting it out there. That was the policy. Um, so they still allow it. They still allow that conflict to continue. But now it's meant to, you know, I guess uh, they're supposed to acknowledge if there's a conflict of interest. But acknowledging the conflict and, and getting rid of the conflict are two different things. The revolving door between government, academia, and the drug industry is one of psychiatry's worst kept secrets. It's a revolving door, FDA and drug, FDA and drug. So we have a, a system where, where the, those uh, institutions that um, people trust, want to trust, would like to trust, are truly untrustworthy. Case in point, Daniel Troy, a former drug company lobbyist who was then hired as general counsel for the FDA, where he filed legal briefs in favor of drug companies and against drug victims. He was the drug lobbyist lawyer, and then he became the, 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 the general counsel uh, of the FDA. I mean, they talk about having uh, uh, the wolf watch, watch the chickens. After leaving the FDA, Daniel Troy went back to the drug industry, where he is now senior vice president and general counsel for pharmaceutical giant GlaxoSmithKline. This is the atmosphere under which psychiatrists at the FDA give drug makers approval to sell psychotropic drugs. But the clinical trials are not supposed to end here. There is one final stage of testing to go, phase four. Phase four requires that drug companies track the adverse side effects that will undoubtedly occur in the general public, well beyond the very small samples of phase three. The sheer number of side effects that will now emerge has prompted one advocacy group to warn that most drug safety problems will not show up until the drug has been on the market for at least seven years. The meds are not tested long term before they get approval from the FDA. The, the studies tend to be a matter of weeks or a few months, but nothing looking at over the years. And the data that's coming in now from Europe and also in the United States uh, is that uh, the side effects are deadly. Instead of serving a safety function as post-marketing surveillance, phase four clinical trials are now being recast as post-marketing research and repurposed into a means of testing psychotropic drugs for additional psychiatric disorders. 
Take Zoloft, FDA approved in 1991 to treat major depression. Since then, it has also been okay to treat obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, panic disorder, and social anxiety disorder. In 2005, the last full year before it lost its patent, Zoloft grossed $3.3 billion. And as with other psychotropic drugs, much of that is pure profit. 100 Xanax pills, for example, only cost two and a half cents to manufacture, but retail on average for $136.79, a profit of well over 500,000%. It is for this reason that drug companies enjoy profit margins of about 16%, triple the norm of most businesses. In 2006, drug company CEOs of the 10 leading drug companies were paid an average of $18 million a year, almost 400 times the median household income of the average American family. Investors also love pharmaceutical companies producing psychotropic drugs, since psychiatrists never prescribe them to cure mental problems, but to manage them, often for a lifetime and lifetime customers have a huge impact on the bottom line. As one stock analyst famously commented, the first disaster is if you kill people, the second disaster is if you cure them. Pharmaceutical company stock has been one of Wall Street's most consistent winners and is widely considered one of the most profitable investments one could make. In 2002, the total profits of the top 10 drug companies in the Fortune 500 exceeded the combined profits of the other 490 businesses. And a downturn in pharmaceutical stock prices would constitute major losses for investors throughout the world, and investments must be protected. With so much money at stake, is it any wonder that stockholders are never told the truth about the drugs they are investing in? They are unaware that FDA approval does not guarantee drug safety and that the clinical trials justifying that approval are frequently based on falsities and deceptions. But once the drug is approved, the next challenge is, how do you convince prescribing physicians that these drugs are truly safe, effective, and carrying few side effects when the drug company's own trials prove that this is not the case? As powerful psychoactive substances, psychotropic drugs are available only through the prescription of a medical doctor. So how did psychiatrists and drug companies succeed in convincing millions of doctors to prescribe them to hundreds of millions of people? Drug companies are anxious to get their products onto the market as soon as possible. This is, after all, a business, and every day can be worth millions. To assure the public and mainstream physicians that their little-tested psychotropics are safe, drug companies spare no expense in getting psychiatrists to stand behind them, and psychiatrists are happy to take the money. It's really quite an interesting marriage that the drug companies have with the medical profession, and, and psychiatry primarily is a strong arm of, of that. This relationship is born in medical school. You go to medical school and you learn that drugs are the answer. And then you go into residency and you, you're told about this whole armamentarian of psychotropic drugs. And if somebody's bipolar, you use this whole group of drugs. If someone's depressed, you use these drugs and so on. And that is the Bible. And when you're a believer, as psychiatrists are, in the Bible of psychiatry, you're in that box called psychiatry, um, you're not likely to stray unless you begin to think for yourself. And once out of medical school, many of these true believing psychiatrists are recruited by drug companies and groomed to be spokesmen. They know then who are the psychiatrists who are most easily influenced, and they can then invest in those doctors, take those doctors to um, whatever fancy resort to be educated about the latest, newest med, and those people then become the experts. They go and give the talks at the medical dinners, at the fancy restaurants, or at the drug-sponsored symposia at 
to the American Psychiatric Association. Um, they become the teachers in the residency training programs. Once these so-called key opinion leaders have canvassed the psychiatrists in their area, they then bridge over to mainstream physicians to convince them to prescribe psychotropic drugs. So you have the psychiatrist coming in now and teaching at an OBGYN convention where they'll give papers there or they'll do, you know, design to address um, GPs and teach the GPs how to look for and diagnose these diseases and these illnesses. And again, the psychiatrist is, they're the ones who are going to know, like in the medical profession, m most of doctors will say, well, these guys are the specialists in the field. I'm going to listen to how they want me to do this so that I can do it in my own practice. And they'll follow that lead and that influence, all funded by the drug companies. Indoctrinating physicians begins at medical conferences like these, where government-mandated continuing medical education, or CME, courses are taught. I'm required once a year to have so many units of postgraduate training, and so I have to go to get my hours by uh, approved training centers that the state uh, recognizes, and those approved training centers are run by the drug companies. But far from being educational, these conferences are frequently produced by professional medical education firms hired by drug companies. And their psychotropic drug seminars are commonly conducted by drug company paid psychiatrists who can be paid up to $2,500 for a single lecture. Most of the continuing, continual medical uh, education co conferences and courses are sponsored by pharmaceutical companies. And so uh, I can guarantee you they're not going to have doctors talking about the risks of using their medications. The purpose of these conferences is clear. As one of the medical education company's marketing materials reads, whatever combination of audiences you need to motivate in order to exert maximum leverage on the marketplace, we can help you identify them, reach them, and influence their behavior. As a marketing strategy, CME works. In one study, prescription rates of doctors following medical education conferences went up 87% for one drug and 272% for another. Not surprisingly, the pharmaceutical industry now spends up to $1 billion for 371,000 such events every year. And as long as they're making money, they're going to do everything they can to subsidize medical education, medical journals, postgraduate medical education, including the educating of psychiatrists, to use as many drugs as possible. And the psychiatrists paid to give these talks make out very well. Case in point, Dr. Charles Nemiroff of Emory University. With deep financial ties to nearly two dozen different drug companies, Dr. Nemiroff received $2.8 million in pharmaceutical money from 2000 to 2007. When it was revealed that he had violated federal law by failing to report $1.2 million of this money to his university, he stepped down as chairman of Emory's psychiatry department. But Dr. Nemiroff did not stop at speeches and personal appearances he was also exposed for having financial ties to a company whose medical device he reviewed favorably in a psychiatric journal he himself edited. On another occasion, he hired 14 Emory University colleagues to write articles for a special supplement of the medical journal celebrating the fifth anniversary of the introduction of the antidepressant Effexor. Nemiroff's journal is one example of a very large problem. In one notable case, the New England Journal of Medicine printed an article whose authors had so many financial ties to drug companies that because of space limitations, the journal was forced to list them on its website. Printed out, these financial conflicts covered three single-spaced typewritten pages. But it goes further. In many instances, respectable journals have been fooled into publishing studies written by drug company ghostwriters but falsely credited to prominent psychiatrists who are paid up to $20,000 to put their names on it. The pharmaceutical industry has set up um, companies that are educational companies, uh, and they create papers uh, that, and uh, subpoenaed evidence has found these papers where on the top it'll say author question mark, i.e. they haven't yet decided who to invite to be the 
author of this scientific paper. Ghostwriting is very common. As many as 50% of published psychiatric research papers are written by ghostwriters. Sometimes the psychiatrist paid to put his name on the article hardly even looked at it. Take, for example, psychiatrist Dr. David Dunner, who endorsed Paxil as lead author in a 1995 study published in the Journal of European Neuropsychopharmacology, only to later admit he had never reviewed any of the study's actual data, but signed off on the summaries instead. Even the FDA's top official for the review of psychotropic drug clinical trials, psychiatrist Dr. Thomas Loughran, has repeatedly signed his name to articles ghostwritten by drug companies that promote the use of antidepressants and antipsychotics. Psychotropics now labeled by the FDA itself as having high risks of suicidal behavior and premature death. Besides their considerable influence over FDA policymakers, drug companies exert extensive control over psychiatric journals by means of substantial advertising budgets. Every other page is a pharmaceutical ad that they pay for, and so they are the livelihood of, of the journals. That's how they get published. Medical journals are completely supported by the ads from drug companies. Without the, the ads, the journals would dwindle away. Doctors look to scientific publications as the objective source. It comes from this university, this research being done by these, you know, highly revered, very um, well-respected, uh, leaders in my industry, if I can't trust them, I mean, it's doctor to doctor. I'm not listening to those sales reps, that's different. This is doctor to doctor. You know, I'm listening to the big guy. And, uh, you know, they've taken over that process. The scientific literature now, you just can't trust it. Today, between two thirds and three quarters of all clinical trials published in major journals are funded by drug companies. And to influence prescribers even more effectively, drug companies will give as much as a million dollars to journals for reprints of favorable trials they can later use as objective-looking marketing tools. But the pharmaceutical funding of psychiatry goes beyond even this, until years of pressure finally forced a recent promise to change. The APA's national conference was largely underwritten by drug companies, as were its government lobbying efforts. But old habits die hard. At a recent APA convention, the drug companies were there, handing out food and giving psychiatrists promotional lectures called product theaters. And they get the vast majority of their funding for their associations, for their meetings, for everything from the pharmaceutical industry. So promoting pharmaceuticals is basically the only options that they have. With psychiatrists already enthusiastically spreading the pharmaceutical gospel to the rest of the medical field, drug companies also attack prescribing physicians on another flank, using armies of drug company sales representatives. We always did a full frontal assault. So we always came in, our product's the best. Our product's the best, our product's the best. Are you gonna write it? Are you gonna write it? Are you gonna write scripts? You, gonna, you know, this was kind of our mentality. My job and my pay was based solely on my ability to push drugs through my territory. So if I wasn't moving enough prescriptions, if I wasn't moving enough pills through my through my territory, I was at risk of being fired, and on a lesser level, you know, I wasn't making the bonus money. The bottom line for you was, it was a business, you got paid, and you had to get as many prescriptions as you needed. That doctor to write, and you did it however you could. One way to get people onto psychotropic drugs is through free samples. These are not provided by psychotropic drug makers out of a sense of charity they are intended to get the patient onto a drug regimen he cannot get off of. Samples sitting on a shelf encourages a doctor to give that drug away and then to write an accompanying prescription for that which will be later filled at the pharmacy. And that's what doctors wanted, to be able to not only have the samples but give them to their friends, their family, lots to the patients because they know if they gave the samples you had a higher incidence of being able to prescribe, the doctors would prescribe your product. You're getting the the physician comfortable with the drug and you're getting the consumer comfortable with the drug. So let's say when the, the trial's over and the free drug's gone for the trial, what's the doctor gonna do? Is he gonna write a prescription of another product? Not if the patient's doing fine. You never wanna rock the boat. 
the industry and the companies fully understand that if you can get those drug samples into a doctor's hand, you're going to be able to get prescriptions out of that doctor. They're actually a very effective marketing tool, and there's quite a large percentage of the marketing budget that goes into the distribution of samples. In 2003, pharmaceutical sales reps handed out $16.4 million worth of free samples. And to sell them even more easily, sales reps have another hidden weapon, prescribing information bought from pharmacies by prescription tracking companies. You'd get a list with like Dr. XYZ, Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil, Celexa, and it would tell you how many scripts, give or take, let's say 10, per month or per week that physician was writing of those products. So we knew everything about our doctors which ones were the most valuable, which ones to spend the most time on, and what we needed to do, and where their weak spots were. So it was very valuable in that you frequently, as the sales rep, knew better what the doctor was actually doing than the doctor did himself, because he wasn't tracking his own prescriptions. The drug industry now spends $22 billion a year marketing to doctors to increase prescriptions, an astonishing 90% of its marketing budget. And this investment has paid off. Today, psychotropic drugs are a multi-billion dollar business with over two-thirds prescribed by general physicians. But psychiatrists are the ones at the forefront, spreading the word. And when the use of psychotropic drugs is questioned or gets bad publicity, paid psychiatric opinion leaders deflect attacks and discredit critics. Or they may simply use their position to make the problem all go away. Case in point, psychiatrist Dr. Daniel Casey, chairman of the first FDA advisory committee that met in 1991 to decide if a warning label about increased risk of suicide should be added to the label of Prozac. At the hearing, family member after family member came forward to show how Prozac had damaged their children and loved ones. In the end, however, Dr. Casey and his colleagues voted against the label, citing a lack of evidence. But what many at the hearing did not know is that five people sitting on that nine-member panel had significant financial ties to drug companies. Casey himself became chairman of an FDA advisory panel that voted to approve another antidepressant, Zoloft, later that same year, and soon became one of Zoloft's most sought-after speakers. But the corruption goes beyond even psychiatrists at the FDA. Directors of major psychiatric institutions are likewise paid handsomely by pharmaceutical companies, such as the deputy director of the New York Psychiatric Institute, who one year received $140,000. Even government agencies are not immune from conflict of interest. In 2006, the state of Texas sued drug maker Janssen for flying the state's own mental health officials to other states throughout the nation to promote its drug Risperdal. Included were perks, travel expenses, and speaking fees. Even at the federal level, the chief of geriatric psychiatry at the U.S. National Institute of Mental Health was convicted that same year for accepting and failing to disclose over a quarter of a million dollars from drug companies in exchange for consultations, retainer fees, and travel expenses. The result of these pharmaceutically paid doctor education campaigns is an explosion in psychotropic drug prescription, not just written by doctors, but by many others. I know some practitioners start people on drugs, on the um, antidepressants. Uh, there's a, unfortunately, a nurse practitioner that does it, and she's not supposed to. It's not in her protocol. Another nurse practitioner I work with has told me that she keeps doing it. It's gotten to the point where you have nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, there are times when that child doesn't even see a doctor. And we're seeing these prescriptions written for, and at best, the doctor may sign off on the bottom of that prescription. Medical professionals worldwide are handing out psychotropic drugs with seemingly few qualms because they have been assured that they are safe and necessary by the experts in the field psychiatrists. The psychiatric community is completely responsible for the widespread use of psychotropic drugs. Uh, they're the ones writing the scripts to the large extent and uh, they're the ones that are proclaiming their supposed beneficial effects 
and uh, I think they're sketchy. The evidence isn't good, and the side effects are horrible. The psychiatrists are the facilitator of the diseases, and therefore the prescriptions. Today, even official psychiatric organizations do not contest that the partnership between psychiatry and pharmaceutical companies in promoting psychotropic drugs to doctors is significant and almost impossible to avoid. But early on, this partnership realized that promoting to doctors was not enough. How could they reach their target demographic, the end user, and drive them into doctors' offices to demand these drugs? In the mid-1970s, Henry Gadsden, head of Merck, one of the world's largest drug corporations, told Fortune magazine that he wanted his company to be more like chewing gum maker Wrigley's and sell to everyone, even healthy people. Has Gadsden's dream come true? Is marketing now driving the machinery of one of the most profitable industries on earth? Are psychotropic drugs really being marketed like chewing gum? Psychotropic drugs are marketed on two fronts. The first is through sales campaigns aimed at doctors, psychiatrists, and other prescribers. And on a second flank, the drugs are promoted heavily to consumers, you. Until recently, however, it was rare to see a drug advertisement on television because by law, drug companies had to list all side effects, a list far too long for a 30 or 60 second spot. But in 1997, drug company lobbyists pressured the U.S. Congress to relax this rule and allow them to mention only some of the side effects. With this simple change, advertising psychotropic drugs on American television suddenly became possible. And this opened the floodgates to a torrent of advertising, which soared from $595 million a year in 1996 to $4.7 billion today an increase of almost 700%. They directed consumer advertising on television. They don't give that message that in order to be healthy, you, you need to be off drugs. Uh, they don't give you that message. They give you the message that, oh, you have a problem, you have an issue, here's the drug that'll fix you. And a lot of money is driving this message home. The average American television viewer now sees as many as 16 hours of drug advertising a year. The pharmaceutical industry reaches right into our living room on a daily basis and tries to convince us that we have this problem that they can solve with a pill. That's, that's dangerous. If you watch any primetime TV, if you watch any primetime news, you're going to get multiple advertisements for whatever the current med is of choice. On television, there are ads now that say, you have got this condition and you're feeling miserable, ask your doctor to give you this pill. Take this pill, it's over the counter. We're being taught our society uh, really pushes the idea of quick, simple answers. Ask your doctor if Abilify is right for you. Ask your doctor about Cymbalta. Talk to your doctor about Zoloft. The no Ask your doctor about Pristine. Ask your doctor if it's Talk right. your doctor about Talk to your doctor about the risks and benefits of adding Abilify. If you can convince somebody that they've got a medical or biological problem, that the only thing that solves it is a pill, it stands to reason you're going to sell more pills. To see how effective this Ask Your Doctor marketing strategy is, one study sponsored by the National Institute of Mental Health in 2005 sent trained actors in to doctors and psychiatrists' offices claiming to be depressed and asking for a specific antidepressant. 50% of them received a prescription for the very drug they requested. And even if the actor did not ask for any psychotropic drug at all, he was given a prescription a third of the time. The doctors feel tremendously pressured to please the patient to prescribe what the patient is asking for. Nobody likes being labeled 
as the doc who didn't do anything for me. The doctor is a businessman, and he knows that if he doesn't fulfill that patient's request, there's a probability that that patient will go elsewhere because he'll find somebody that's willing to prescribe that drug. It should be the doctor's choice. It should be the doctor's evaluation driving the use of any medication. It shouldn't be giving a patient the opportunity to see something on TV and come in and ask for it by name because doctors then be, are immediately put in a situation where they feel pressured to pull out the pres prescription pad, whereas they should, uh, they should have come to that conclusion based on their, their actual clinical data. But getting the patient to walk in and demand psychotropic drugs for non-existent diseases has taken that power out of doctors' hands. And this has been done through psychiatric drug marketing campaigns that fill the coffers of media outlets. Drug advertising on television, for example, accounts for 55% of the pharmaceutical industry's direct-to-consumer advertising budget. And estimates show that if this television advertising were ever banned, prescription sales in the United States alone would plummet by $10 billion. Magazines and other print media also depend on pharmaceutical companies for much of their advertising dollars, over $1.8 billion a year. But is this a good thing? Do such massive amounts of ad revenue taint what we see in the media? You know, obviously the advertising pays for the television programs. So the real money is in the advertising, not in the television program. So that's where the money is. I don't know of too many magazines that want to run huge advertisements blasting the drug companies that are paying for the magazine on the next page. Um, they're going to take a lot of heat and people are going to pull their ads if they start doing that. So again, you have a huge conflict of interest um, at play with the, the mass media. This partnership between the pharmaceutical industry and the media also extends to public service announcements promoting psychiatric disease. Americans living with schizophrenia. Kids with ADHD or you have postpartum depression. Still dealing with depression? It could be your time for change. Psychiatrists are featured promoting drugs in video news releases, which look just like TV news reports, but are in reality drug company produced marketing spots. On news interviews, the experts furnished come from approved drug company speakers bureaus, and these psychiatrists rarely disclose their financial ties. As a result, mental health care segments in the media rarely deviate from the psychiatric party line. Psychotropic drugs are mentioned in movies and television, such as Prozac on the TV series The Sopranos, and Zoloft, a product placement in the film The Sixth Sense. This mountain of marketing is not confined to broadcast media only. Print, too, is inundated with drug propaganda, masquerading as news and information. All you have to do is look at any uh, accepted uh, magazine in America today, whether it be an even um, a woman's journal or a men's journal. There's always some type of pharmaceutical product that's being focused. And they've gone so far as to give away free samples. All you have to do is write in this coupon. And the psychiatric drug message has even infiltrated the taxpayer-supported public radio. For instance, psychiatrist Frederick Goodwin hosted a talk show for years where he championed the use of psychotropic drugs. As we'll be hearing today, Dr. Goodwin assured his listeners, modern treatments, mood stabilizers in particular, have been proven both safe and effective in bipolar children. What he did not say was that he would be paid $2,500 by pharmaceutical company GlaxoSmithKline to give a lecture that very night promoting their mood stabilizer drug, Lamictal. And there was more. The very week that Dr. Goodwin told radio audiences that there is no credible scientific evidence linking antidepressants to violence or to suicide, he raked in $20,000 from Glaxo which had already admitted that it had suppressed studies revealing that its antidepressant Paxil increased the risk of suicide. Further investigation revealed that Goodwin had failed to report more than $1.3 million in drug company income. Might this level of conflict of interest be preventing the mainstream media from revealing the full truth about psychiatric drugs? As long as we have direct-to-consumer advertising, <laughs> and the marketing dollars of the pharmaceutical companies put into it, you will not hear uh, a companion story or any information about a, 
a school shooter or a, a person who went to their work and killed all their family members and friends, you will never hear whether or not they were on a medication. What you will hear is how depressed they were. And you'll have consultant after consultant and psychiatrist after psychiatrist coming up and being interviewed to discuss um, how mentally screwed up this person was and how they weren't doing their treatment the way they were supposed to or they didn't seek treatment when they should have. This story has protected psychiatrists and their drugs for decades. To understand why one hears it so often, one need look no further than the bottom line. As parts of large corporate giants, today's media companies are in the business of making money. And to their CEOs, keeping stock prices high is part of their job description. And when pharmaceutical advertising money is your lifeblood, there is little chance you will rock the boat. With traditional sources so compromised, one might wonder if the information they're getting on psychotropic drugs really is the whole story. But what about the internet? Well, psychiatrists and drug companies are already pushing psychotropic drugs in cyberspace too, with very few restrictions. If a patient goes online and looks up a drug and puts in a drug's name and there'll be a bunch of sites that come up, many of those sites will be funded by the drug companies, but you won't be able to tell from the site. You'd have to you know, dig up, if at all, you may have no idea that that site was funded at all by the drug company. Um, and especially those ones like Ask a Doctor, those are definitely drug company driven. Through every communication outlet they can influence, psychiatrists and drug companies team up to drum out one single relentless message. You are sick. We've got the answer. And ask your doctor. Women are a special target for these campaigns, both through magazines and daytime talk shows. This appears to be working, with almost two-thirds of all psychotropic drugs taken by women. We don't get the full truth because the media is owned by Big Pharma. You just turn on your radio or open your newspaper and you'll find ads. They're not going to bite the hand that feeds them. They don't tell the truth. It's a vicious cycle because the more dr these drugs are, are marketed, the more people want to take them, the more money goes to pharma to market more drugs. But despite their success, psychiatrists and the drug companies they work for are not satisfied only with media campaigns. So their next strategy is, how do you convince even more people to take psychotropic drugs, all the while remaining a hidden influence? Billions are spent every year by drug companies to advertise their latest drug. These efforts are obvious. But are there hidden ways that psychiatrists and drug companies can get you to ask your doctor without your even knowing it? It might seem impossible that an appetite for psychotropic drugs could be created without one's even being aware of it. Could this possibly be true? Well, if you know what to look for, you will find drug marketing campaigns practically everywhere. In hospitals, programs promoting psychotropics air over closed-circuit television networks like The Patient Channel. You can find them in children's books such as Brandon and the Bipolar Bear, where a little boy is told that his feelings are caused by chemicals in his brain that can be controlled with good medicine. There are mental health awareness programs touring college campuses to promote mental health checkups. Another hidden promotion lured high school girls to a conference on eating disorders to pitch them Zoloft. Where do these campaigns come from? Many of them come from industry-funded front groups operated by psychiatrists but posing as compassionate patient support groups a group that's focused on people who get depressed or, you know, these support groups. Those are all also funded by and driven by, in large part, the drug companies. The fact that they're being, you know, highly funded by the drug companies puts into question, you know, the information that they're providing. In fact, a recent global survey estimates that two-thirds of all patient advocacy groups depend on drug companies or device manufacturers for at least some of their income. 
through media interviews, public service announcements, and promotional events, psychiatric front groups preach the message that at least one quarter of everyone on Earth is mentally ill. You could be too, and there is nothing you can do about it short of taking psychotropics for the rest of your life. And of all the programs they use to get people onto these drugs, one of the most successful is the benevolent-sounding mental health screening campaign. But it all begins with psychiatrists and their very broad DSM-based screening questionnaires that cover common life situations such as sadness, nervousness, and occasional loneliness. Because the symptoms are so subjective and the way they decide to describe it, everybody's got depression. So then they started targeting the kids um, and doing this at schools, and they implemented it through the school process of coming to the schools and having depression screening days. People would come in and they'd fill out these uh, questionnaires and, oh yeah, you've got it, um, brought in quite a few new customers. But with statistics proving that more than a quarter of those screened at thousands of screening sites later start taking antidepressants, it's hard to see screening as anything other than a spectacular marketing opportunity. One such front group, Screening for Mental Health Incorporated, sponsors national campaigns such as National Depression Screening Day, which uses simple quizzes to screen people for mental illness. But what is not revealed is that screening for mental health has taken in a total of almost five million dollars from at least seven different drug companies, all makers of psychotropic drugs given to children. Of all demographics, these mental health screening companies especially target teenagers. Teen Screen is the biggest such screening program in the world, a U.S. national program targeting high school students under the guise of suicide prevention. Teen Screen was developed by Dr. David Schaffer, a psychiatrist with heavy ties to the drug industry. Teen Screen is a series of questions that take about 10 minutes for kids to answer. It's targeted at high school kids. On the Teen Screen case, it asks, do you sometimes feel like other people uh, have an easier life or, you know, do sometimes you feel bad about yourself and other times you feel good about yourself? Well, given where you are in that particular day and what's happened, you're gonna answer that differently. Once this test comes back that the child answered it based on how his emotions were at that very moment, that information gets passed back to the school, possibly the guidance counselor, adjustment counselor, or the school counselor herself, and that child is then referred on to mental health agency. And studies now show that once in front of a psychiatrist, nine out of 10 children are prescribed a psychotropic drug. Using alarming language and misleading statistics, Teen Screen attempts to frighten parents, fearful that their child may be suicidal. But a closer look reveals that this is not a suicide prevention program at all, but a drug marketing campaign. And this marketing and its wide diagnostic net creates a huge rate of what are known as false positives. By Schaffer's own admission, 84% of all students taking the teen screen test were falsely labeled as depressed or suicidal. Predictably, teen screen is viewed with suspicion by many parents. To get around this, teen screen personnel have offered school children such enticements as movie coupons or free pizza to motivate them to get their parents' signature on the consent form. To eliminate parental objection altogether, Teen Screen has even instituted a passive consent policy, whereby if the parent does not formally object in writing, the child is assumed to have gotten permission and is then screened. Typically, the permission slip that comes home is a permission slip that if you don't sign it, they will give the children the screening anyway. And for many who do complete the screening questionnaire, the results can be devastating. In Colorado, Teen Screen labeled over half of all school children as at risk for suicide, in spite of a government documented teen suicide rate of less than one in 10,000. Far fewer odds than being struck by lightning. In fact, in the last decade, the American teen suicide rate has not risen, but has actually fallen by 25%. There's no data that supports that you know, doing something like a teen screen is actually going to reduce suicides. Um, 
they themselves have indicated that the numbers are so small, the suicide rate is so small, that you know you can't really get an accurate read on whether it works or not. On top of this, there is now evidence that far from preventing suicide, screening programs actually cause it. The chair of the National Institute of Mental Health Research Consortium concluded, participants were more likely to consider suicide a solution to a problem after the program than before the program. And research has shown that once put on psychotropic drugs, children are more likely not just to consider suicide, but to actually follow through. That you may have more people that are so distraught by the way they are when they're under the influence of the drug that they do commit suicide. And I think it's entirely possible that they're not, instead of saving lives, they're going to be uh, losing lives to suicide. With no evidence of effectiveness on one hand and a huge downside on the other, Teen Screen is still being run in 43 states at over 500 sites. But it is not the only screening program aimed at children. The Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance System administers a 35-minute test in at least 45 states. Yet another, Signs of Suicide Incorporated, has screened thousands of children at 3,500 schools across the United States. They, too, are heavily backed by pharmaceutical money. And so far, for psychiatrists and drug companies, it has been a great investment. Throwing out a net and doing a typical teen screen or any type of mass assessment, we now have increased our client population ten, tenfold by kids who need to be either seen by a therapist and or seen by a psychiatrist. The internet is another rich source of new prospects. Take, for example, the Patient Health Questionnaire, a 16-item checklist that allows anyone to diagnose himself with depression within eight minutes. One of the questionnaire's developers was psychiatrist Dr. Robert Spitzer, the architect of DSM-3, and its copyright is owned by Pfizer, the world's largest pharmaceutical company and maker of the antidepressant Zoloft. There is also a two-question version that can take less than a minute to advise you to ask your doctor. Online screening questionnaires abound, testing such potential psychiatric disease categories as bipolar disorder, ADHD, narcissism, self-esteem problems, eating disorders, and sex addiction. We all have ups and downs because that's what normal life is. If you administer the screening on those times where you have down, you're gonna be labeled as having a mental health issue. Where if you took the same screening later, you may not be, but you've already been labeled that way. And that's the danger of that. And labels last a lifetime. So far, screening campaigns have been limited to those willing to participate. But what if the screenings are no longer voluntary? Will this lead to increased drugging? Psychiatrists insist that a mental health screening would be beneficial for everyone. But is this true? And what are the risks? In 2003, a presidential advisory group known as the New Freedom Commission on Mental Health issued a comprehensive program that laid out its strategy for screening major segments of American society for signs of mental illness. Some of their goals included programs creating early detection of mental illness, enlarging the role of schools in diagnosing and treating mental problems, and expanding the use of mental health screening beyond the psychiatrist's couch and into the offices of primary care physicians. It's going to screen the population for mental health, the whole population. They're going to do it by stages, starting with school children, of course. So far, mandatory mental health screening is not yet a reality, except for a few small segments of society. One of them consists of the most powerless and disenfranchised of them all, foster children. A child goes into foster care, they label the child with some kind of a psychological problem. The child is immediately sent to therapy. Well, the therapist will say, well, I believe the child needs to be on something. So they recommend 
the, the child see a psychiatrist to have the drug administered. Out of the 60, 65 families that I see, um, I mean, easily 90% of the kids are, they have the mental health diagnosis to begin with. Um, if they get it from a psychiatrist, it almost always comes with meds. And I think that um, we see um, identified as at-risk kids in the community and we see some of the most intense situations. Um, and a lot of them are on four or five different meds. I've seen children that uh, when the day they're taken out of their parents' custody and placed in the state custody, uh, actually seem happy, healthy, uh, vibrant, uh, uh, energetic and then you know two months later after they began taking these medications they are very slow they uh, are zombie like it is the best way to describe it today all children entering texas's foster care system receive mental health screening the result 60 percent of the state's foster child population is diagnosed and put on at least one psychotropic drug including some children as young as three years old and it is worse in other states. In Massachusetts, for example, two-thirds of children in state care are being treated for mental illness. Nationally, foster children are being drugged at over triple the rate of children in the general population, such as in the case of seven-year-old foster child Gabriel Myers on two powerful psychotropic drugs, one carrying an FDA warning for causing suicidal thoughts in children when he hanged himself with a shower hose. Another market segment is active duty soldiers who are routinely screened at military clinics, labeled with a mental disorder and given powerful and potentially violence inducing drugs. Iraq wasn't like Vietnam. There weren't illegal drugs everywhere, but uh, there were drugs everywhere because you know, every guy on post, uh, they knew they needed, all they needed to do was go down and see the, the combat stress unit, the shrink, and uh, he was the drug dealer on post for us. Almost everybody was that saw the body or was experienced the event were put on uh, some sort of psychotropic medication. Some bases where my friends were at, my fellow veterans were at, uh, that, you know, everyone, the whole platoon was on drugs. I would say about 75% of active duty military is addicted to some type of psychotropic drug. You can walk around a military barracks and you ask someone for some Prozac and somebody's got some Prozac or some Xanax or some Zoloft. I've got friends who were in the army with me who are now dependent on um, Zoloft and um, psychotropic drugs just because they got used to it in Iraq and they didn't ever want to get off it and now they're dependent on it and addicted to it. We have huge numbers of military people on antidepressants and instead of the suicide rate going down, which you'd expect if the drugs were effective, the suicide rate is going up. This last January, we had more soldiers commit suicide than we had die in combat. And what's not being brought out much yet is the fact that the large majority of these soldiers were on these drugs. We're drugging the military at a rate we've never, ever seen before. And this is just the beginning. Military mental health screening programs are planned for 43 clinics in 15 bases throughout the United States, Germany, and Italy. Studies reveal that as many as 12% of those serving in Iraq and 17% in Afghanistan are on some type of antidepressant or sleeping pill. A total of 20,000 service members. But this number pales in comparison to the number of pregnant or postnatal women that could be drugged should mandatory psychiatric screening laws for them come to pass. And when a woman is pregnant, right during the pregnancy, specifically right afterwards, her hormones are changing and sometimes raging. And to screen them and call it mental illness, if they have any type of emotional issues in any way, shape or form, is utterly ludicrous. Even without laws mandating it, expectant mothers may be screened for mental illness and not even know it. Here are some women interviewed coming out of their doctor's offices. Have you ever been screened for mental illness? I have not been screened for mental illness. I know I've never been screened for any mental illness. I don't remember any pre-screening. I have not been. No. No? Have you ever been screened for any mental illness? No, I have not been screened for any mental illness. Did your OB, UIN, or gynecologist uh, have you fill out a questionnaire that contains psychological questions? 
Yes, my OBGYN did give me a questionnaire that has psychological questions. I've never been screened for mental illness. Uh, yeah, so I would say the first time I went to see my OBGYN, I did fill out questionnaires about even family medical history, my medical history, my mental state. I've not been screened for any mental illness or depression. I took a questionnaire, my six week checkup, and it basically asked me about if I was um, crying, if I felt depressed. Yeah, it was, it was a questionnaire about um, depression. If you're depressed or if you had any history of depression. Are you happy with your normal day? Are you uh, happy about being pregnant? Or have you ever hurt yourself? Or are you happy? If I feel like hurting someone if I was angry. Do mental illness run in your family? You know, it was very noticeable to me after the pregnancy that they're actually fishing for the postpartum depression. When I was pregnant with my daughter, uh, before I had her, I had to be uh, take postpartum uh, depression medicine uh, from my seventh month on to my ninth month. And where is the screening leading? To programs like a little-known drugging scheme originally formulated in Texas in 1995 called the Texas Medication Algorithm Project, or TMAP. TMAP is a program that was originated starting in the 90s, a collaborative group of doctors from University of Texas and the Texas Department of uh, mental health and mental retardation. And what it was supposed to do was come up with the best practice for treating mental illness. Using research funding from 11 different pharmaceutical companies, this panel, dominated by psychiatrists, created a step-by-step -step flowchart that requires the prescribing of only the latest and most expensive psychiatric drugs for patients with mental problems. And if one psychotropic didn't work, doctors were obligated to try another expensive one. And if none worked, the next step would be electric shock treatment. But those running TMAP were hiding a major conflict of interest. They didn't disclose that the researchers that were all involved in creating this, almost every single one of them had financial relationships with the pharmaceutical companies. But Texas isn't the only state with problems of corruption. Alan Jones was an investigator in the office of the Pennsylvania Inspector General. I learned that these monies were all coming in to the state to support and to promote a program called TMAP, the Texas Medication Algorithm Project. And so my concern was peaked very quickly that there was at least one state official who might be inappropriately receiving and dispersing monies from drug companies. They called it PenMAP, uh, but it was based entirely on the TMAP model. Uh, also very quickly, I learned that there were other state employees who were serving on advisory boards financed through various pharmaceutical companies and other state employees who were accepting honorariums personally, directly, uh, from drug companies for speaking in their state capacities or official capacities. That's a felony in Pennsylvania. I saw there was a much bigger picture and attempted to surface that bigger picture and was consistently told to back off. I was told that drug companies write checks to politicians on both sides of the aisle. Back off. You will not expand this investigation into the drug companies. Continue to press the investigation, much of it on my own time at this point. Uh, I became increasingly alarmed that all of the drugs recommended by the TMAP program were exclusively the new patented atypical antipsychotics for schizophrenia and all of the brand new patented SSRI antidepressants, none of it added up. When it became obvious to me that my investigation was not going to be permitted to continue, and it became obvious to the Inspector General's office that I was not going to stop, uh, I was removed from lead investigator on the, on the case. They threatened me with loss of career, with loss of job, with loss of reputation, essentially. Despite the investigation resulting in the conviction of Pennsylvania's chief pharmacist, TMAP and offshoots like PenMAP spread throughout the country, generating billions of dollars in drug sales. But the psychiatric gravy train comes at great public cost. In 2001, TMAP and its children's equivalent, CMAP, bankrupted the Texas Medicaid program and the state's mental health and prison systems. So what do we see in the final picture? 
A government-run, taxpayer-funded mental health screening program wherein every person judged by psychiatrists to have a mental illness is given powerful, dangerous, and expensive psychotropic drugs. And if they don't work, electroshock treatment. They're going to start with school children on the new Freedom Initiative. Then they're going to move it to senior citizen nursing homes. Then they're going to move it to, um, uh, of course, military. And then parents. By the time you're 18, you've been screened in utero <laughs> when you were an infant. You were screened as an infant when you first came out. You were screened in your you know, daycare. You were screened then at school. You were screened at the pediatrician's office. You are screened in high school. You are screened over and over again. And to sit there and pass laws requiring that people be screened and drug based on screening under state law or federal law is uh, really, it's criminal. It should not be done. They're marketing this madness all over this country. And we are actually becoming an example for the rest of the world. So we're, again, the, the poster child, if you will. And so the rest of the world's spending more and more on drugs. I don't know that there was ever a time in the history of the world where people have been drugged to the extent of what we're seeing today. The reality is, if you look at the overall picture, I don't see these drugs helping us make a better society. We see it in the military. We see it in our children, we see it in the schools. These drugs are not working to make a better society. And with hidden mental illness marketing campaigns at full tilt, what happens to patients once diagnosed and delivered into the psychotropic drugging machine? If drugs are being sold as safe and effective by psychiatrists and drug companies, why is it that we are seeing an alarming increase in consumer-reported adverse side effects? What are psychiatrists not telling us? All drugs create biological changes in the human body. In mainstream medicine, those changes that are intended are called main effects. Those that aren't are called side effects. No drug is without effects, side or otherwise. But with psychiatric drugs targeting delicate brain processes, all effects, even main effects, can be hazardous, unpredictable, and sometimes irreversible. In all these medications that are apparently supposed to be act as a magic pill, they're finding they all of them all of them have side effects that, you know, could put the patient in harm's way just as well as it could help them. So just what are these drugs doing, and how do they work? To find out, you should be able to locate much of this information in the drug's package insert, or PI. Contained in this insert is the mechanism of action, the drug maker's explanation for how the drug works on the body. Take, for example, antibiotics, drugs used for over 50 years as a cure for infectious diseases such as tetanus, tuberculosis, and strep throat. Its mechanism of action is well known. Antibiotics prevent the cellular activity of bacteria, thus inhibiting its growth or killing it altogether. But with psychotropics, drug makers say on their own package insert that their mechanism of action is unknown. Most of the medications that are given to clients, whether SSRI um, medications or their antipsychotics, a lot of the uh, pharmacology of these medications, they don't even know how they work in the first place. But it has been noted that there is one primary side effect of psychotropics that is common to all. Most medication and psychotropic medication I've noticed tends to flatten the things so that while you're decreasing the depression, you're also decreasing the joy. And so you're minimizing what it means to be human in the service of avoiding dealing with a problem. They can't connect to the world around them. They feel like there's no feeling, which is you know, you should have some feeling there. All that's doing is really numbing them down, and they're not doing the work that they need to do to resolve that issue that's going on somewhere internally. But the numbing of emotions is not the only way psychotropic drugs affect the user. Each of the five main classes of psychotropics has side effects of its own. Typical antipsychotics, such as Thorazine, 
are powerful chemicals originally designed to shut down the central nervous systems of mental hospital inmates. They are now mainly used on people with serious mental problems, and they can cause feelings of helplessness, deterioration of the mind, neurological damage, dementia, trembling, twitching, and damage to internal organs, to name a few. Anti-anxiety drugs such as Valium and Xanax are prescribed for nervousness, anxiety, and panic disorders. They can cause patients dissociation, cognitive impairment, increased aggression, fatigue, hallucination, and acute amnesia. They've got foggy thinking. They're bloated. They're heavy. They have weight gain. They're now diabetic. It's one symptom after another, all caused from the drugs that they're taking, and they don't realize it. Stimulant drugs like Ritalin, Adderall, and Concerta are mainly used for people with so-called attention problems, such as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. These drugs are very addictive and can result in stunted growth, weight loss, manic behavior, heart palpitations, neurological tics, cardiac arrhythmia, gross brain shrinkage and malfunction, anxiety, insomnia, violent behavior, and even sudden death. Ritalin, a stimulant commonly prescribed to children, acts on the body in a very similar way to cocaine, but is far more potent. And recent studies show that it can cause permanent changes in children's developing brains. So you're going to have problems, and it is shown that some of these medications, particularly the um, stimulants that they're giving, like Ritalin, and Concerta, all the ADHD medications, actually shrink brain tissue. They know that these psychiatric drugs destroy cells, destroy brain cells, shrink brain tissue. How can that possibly ever benefit anyone? It can't. That's the simplicity. It's not possible. Antidepressants are a fourth class of psychotropic drug. As their name suggests, they are used to treat depression and mood disorders. The list of side effects includes blurred vision, dry mouth, low blood pressure, internal bleeding, weight gain, sleep disturbance, seizures, impaired cardiac function, and psychosis. The most common thing that I see is the sexual dysfunction. So women having a hard time reaching orgasm or just finding that their libido is lower. And I see that with men as well. And the second most common thing I see is weight gain. I, I have to say it is not terribly uncommon to see a 40 pound weight gain with antidepressants. One study found that Paxil, a leading antidepressant, increases the risk of breast cancer in women by seven times. Perhaps riskiest of all is the drugging of pregnant or postnatal women with antidepressants for depression. When the mother takes the drugs, the psychiatric drugs, or any type of drug in that like an antidepressant or anti-anxiety or an antipsychotic drug, that's going to affect the baby as well as the mother, not just the mom, because the baby's going to get it straight through the umbilical cord, through the bloodstream. The drugging of pregnant women has led to a 20 to 30% hazard of preterm birth, brain damage, and lower fetal age at delivery, and nearly triples the risk of severe birth defects. And the antidepressants have been shown to uh, cause something called PPHN, which is a heart problem in newborns. And I, it's, I think it's criminal to be giving medications to women knowing that their babies are going to be at risk. When mom takes Paxil, she can have a baby born with the, the sometimes they have the limbs are missing, it's called limb reduction. Uh, they have, can have cleft lip, they can have serious heart defects, missing chambers or the arteries in the wrong place. Um, and also can be born with the organs uh, growing outside of the body. And these are just a few of the many, many side effects of psychotropic drugs. Among the top three best-selling antidepressant drugs called SSRIs, there are 1,817 possible side effects associated with Prozac, 2,194 with Zoloft, and 2,497 with Paxil. Interestingly, among these is the worsening of the exact same symptoms the drugs claim to address. They cause depression. They cause suicidal tendencies and ideologies. So they cause a lot of the very exact symptoms that they're supposed to be correcting. They're being treated for depression with a 
product that's going to create depression. They're treating for, for a psychosis with something that's actually going to create or has the potential of creating a psychosis. Atypical antipsychotics, one of the newest classes of psychotropic drugs, are used mainly on adults and children diagnosed with bipolar disorder. They are also known as mood stabilizers. Though launched with storied claims as miracle drugs with little or no side effects, atypical antipsychotics have recently been exposed as creating severe weight gain, diabetes, coronary heart disease, acutely irregular muscle movement, pancreatitis, and delirium. Though the new antipsychotics were originally approved only to treat schizophrenic adults, over a seven-year period, prescriptions for children jumped five-fold to an estimated 2.5 million prescriptions. And this drugging is coming with serious consequences. You know, I've seen kids who have had significant weight gain on some of the antipsychotics, um, where they were pre-diabetic. You know, they've had you know changes in some of their um, cardiovascular functioning. Um, so there are potentials. Um, to really damage uh, the child's health. When you get drugs that you're giving to kids that we know cause extreme weight gain and attack the liver, attack the kidney, that have long-term results, these children that we're giving them today, this medication, we may be doing you know, kidney dialysis for in 10, 15 years. And it is not only children that can be affected. It has been estimated that psychotropic drugs are to blame for over 16,000 traffic accidents every year in the United States. And this study only looked at drivers 65 and older. And what happens when these unwanted side effects surface? Usually, the psychiatrist will prescribe yet another drug. It's called polypharmacy. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, adding additional, you know, if the first drug doesn't work, you add a second drug. If you have an adverse side effect from a drug, then you add another drug to deal with the adverse side effect. And then let's say they start an antidepressant and now they can't sleep. So in order to counteract that, they'll be given a sleeping pill. Then a tolerance builds up. So they might now need another drug because they're now at a tolerance level of the first drug that it's no longer creating the, quote, expected or helpful result. It's un not uncommon to see people five, six, eight, nine, you know, psychotropic drugs. And there's absolutely not a shred of research that supports that these drugs can be used safely and effectively in combination. Consider tardive dyskinesia, a movement disorder entirely caused by psychotropic drugs. For 20 years, beginning in the 50s, psychiatrists failed to inform patients about the link between tardive dyskinesia and antipsychotics, such as Thorazine and Haldol. By the time psychiatrists admitted the truth about their pills, thousands had been permanently crippled. Even today, tardive dyskinesia has developed in 73,000 older adults, and drug-induced Parkinsonism has appeared in 61,000 more. But this class of psychotropics is far from the exception. Reports are now surfacing that today's atypical antipsychotics and antidepressants, such as Zoloft, are causing widespread tardive dyskinesia, sometimes within months of first use. But psychiatrists and drug companies continue to dispute this damning new evidence and go on prescribing these drugs, even to children. But of all the side effects experienced by users of psychotropic drugs, the most horrendous may be an intense inner agitation and restlessness known as akathisia. These drugs can cause something called akathisia, which causes people to become very agitated. Uh, and actually a, a, little, a little nuts, you know, a little off balance. And they'll do things that they never would have done before, things that are totally out of character. This is a normal person without any history of auditory hallucinations, and all of a sudden they'll say there's voices telling them this is the only way to stop the pain, it's the only way is to kill themselves. Had patients tell me that they never, ever, ever had one single thought about suicide in their entire life until they started on the drug. An estimated 10 to 25 percent of SSRI antidepressant users, close to 7 million people in the U.S., experience akathisia. And Psychiatry's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders even admits the connection between psychotropic drugs, akathisia, and suicide. The statistics back this up. 
the suicide rate of the general population is less than 11 for every 100,000. But for every 100,000 people taking SSRIs, the suicide rate jumps to 718, over 65 times more. And yet, we are told daily by psychiatrists and drug companies that psychotropic drugs actually prevent suicide. So, what are we to believe? One can start with the drug company's own warning letters to doctors, or unpublished data for the antidepressant Effexor, or an analysis of Prozac using the FDA's own statistics, or even a British House of Commons report on Zyprexa. Of course, not everyone commits suicide, but the huge volume of other side effects can be horrendous. The medication that the psychiatrist prescribed me made me feel awful. Constant headaches, constant nausea, wanting my skin to turn inside out, just feeling like bugs were crawling all over me all the time. It made me feel like all slow and like, like sluggish and stuff. Like and when somebody would ask me something, it would kind of like take a minute like, what? These drugs have affected my heart. They have affected my liver. Weight gain one time hit like 40 pounds. These thoughts come over me like I wanted to kill some. I wanted to really hurt somebody. It just sucks all the life out of you. So you're like a body, like a machine. I didn't want to live. I didn't have the desire to live. I felt miserable. You just can't live, you know? You'd just rather die. Because there's no living when you're hallucinating every day. I actually tried to commit suicide with my psych meds. At some point when you realize that you are really just existing, you're not living. At some point, you, you, you realize you need to take the risk to get off. But what about those who say psychotropic drugs really did make them feel better? That for them, these are life-saving medications whose benefits exceed their risks. Are psychotropics actually safe and effective for them? So what ends up happening is that someone feels good for a while, and then very often they have to have their dose increased and then they feel good for a while, and then they might have to have it increased again, or maybe they'll switch agents. So it's, it's that kind of a story if you're not actually getting to the root of what's going on. I think the research is pretty clear that that then often starts to change, and you start to have a super sensitivity to being depressed, in which case then they become more depressed, and then they're chronically depressed. And there is ample evidence that if the short-term side effects of psychotropics don't get you, the long-term effects will. Psychiatric drugs are toxic to the body. They do build up in the body and add to the body's reserve and reservoir of toxins that will suppress the immune system and the body will try and fight them as foreign objects. If they're on these medications for years and years and years, I mean, one of the things that we know about adults and some of the, um, you know, for bipolar and schizophrenia is that they're, they're dying at younger ages. And these are adults, so if we're starting this, this, this you know, medication approach with young kids, you know, what, what is their life expectancy going to be? No one's really examined it or is looking at the big picture, which is, what does it really do to a society uh, with a proliferation of mood-altering, emotion-altering, or blunting? Uh, in a society at large. And I think we're going to really see a huge, huge increase in um, violence and suicide and a lot of bizarre behaviors um, that we haven't seen because for a very short period of time, only in the last 60 years, have we really started you know, medicating, intoxicating our brain with these incredibly toxic, toxic substances. The very real probability of significant long and short-term side effects should give anyone considering taking psychotropic drugs great pause. But what about those already taking them, who, no matter how hard they try, cannot get off? Psychotropic drugs have long been noted for having a multitude of physical and emotional side effects that many simply cannot live with. But if side effects from psychotropics are so bad, why do some people continue to take them?
Psychiatrists, drug companies, and even government agencies are entrusted with the safety of the drugs they put on the marketplace. And while they will reluctantly admit to most side effects of psychotropics, there is one more that they almost never mention. Every single one of these drugs are addictive, psychologically and or physically addictive. They change your body's uh, makeup. You change your body how it reacts to things. And so even though people, their psychological state, they may be over their depression, they physically will need that drug still. And so that becomes the complication of getting them off. I have people come to me on a weekend, they run out of refills, and they say to me, if I don't take this drug, I'm gonna get sick. If I don't take this drug, I'm gonna get sick. We don't talk about psychologically. We don't talk about depression. We don't talk about anxiety. I am going to get sick if I don't take this drug this weekend. It has nothing to do with psychology. But listen to what some psychiatrists questioned at a recent APA conference had to say about addiction. How addictive are psychiatric drugs? They aren't only benzodiazepines. They're not addictive at all. Antidepressants are not generally considered addictive. SSRIs are not addictive. Antipsychotics, they don't cause addiction. Major tranquilizers are all safe as far as addiction is concerned. The drugs that most of us are using in neuropsychiatry are not addictive at all. So who's right? To find out, we need look no further than former patients with first-hand experience. The psychologists and psychiatrists I uh, went to both. They they never told me that they would be addictive. They would cause me to have these thoughts. For sure, the psychiatric drugs I was on was addicting. Within six six months to nine months, I was I was hooked. Poison X had it had a hold of me. I mean. I was going through a bottle of pills every three or four days. I, mean, I lost my job over it. Over a prescription drug that's not supposed to be addictive, I lost my job. The reality is that it is addicting. It will wreck a person's life. This conflict on addiction all comes down to a definition of words. Most people think of addiction as an uncontrollable psychological or physical need for a certain substance. But not psychiatrists. They define addiction as the craving of a higher and higher dose of the same drug, while the uncontrollable need to keep taking a drug is categorized only as dependence. This is why psychiatrists will not admit that their drugs are addictive. In their definition, a very small percentage of people become addicted. The reality is a large percentage of people can't get off these drugs, and they call that dependence. It's all a matter of how they term it. And when you look at addiction, it could be that their tolerance increases and their uh, needs and wants to use the medications increase, or it could be they simply, once they start on the medication, they're not able to come off of it without help. They try to, and as soon as they try to come off the medications, they start to have symptoms that are unwanted and obviously keep them wanting to take the medications again. When you explain to them how addictive it is, they are surprised because they're like, well, it's a prescription. So I do believe that a lot of people don't really know how uh, harmful these meds are. They don't view them as, um, as dangerous as some of the street drugs. But many psychotropics have become street drugs, especially the class of drugs given to children diagnosed as having inattention or hyperactivity. Stimulants such as Ritalin, Adderall, and Concerta are so habit-forming that they are listed by the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration as Schedule II drugs, highly addictive substances on the same list as morphine and cocaine. Biochemistry and pharmacology of Ritalin is exactly the same as that of cocaine, except for the speed of onset. The similarity between Ritalin and cocaine becomes obvious when considering the major problem of stimulant abuse in our schools, where tablets of Ritalin and its chemical cousin Adderall are taken recreationally by kids in schoolyards. Some of my friends took Ritalin and Adderall just to get high, like that I've known throughout the years. Kids will, will um, chop that stuff up with a razor blade. It's pure, man pure drug, you know? That's that's why kids like it. They'd chop it up with a razor blade and snort it. My cousin Sammy had this Ritalin and we would eat it and we'd be able to stay up all night and play, and play video games. It was 
pupils would dilate. It, it was just outrageous. Matter of fact, um, in eighth grade, I got kicked out of school three days before it let out for uh, um, selling Ritalin and actually snorting lines in the back of the classroom. So yes, sir, it definitely, um, it definitely caused me some problems there. And uh, I definitely had people uh, behind them from me, yes. This is no small problem. In 2006, researchers discovered that more than 7 million Americans had misused stimulants, with 75,000 American teenagers and young adults becoming addicted every year. Beyond just addicting its users, stimulants are also well known as gateway drugs that lead to further addiction to such street drugs as cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamine. When you provide drugs in a manner which most of our children are being provided drugs at an early age in life, only prepares that child to be on more drugs as they get older. And yet in several recent publications, psychiatrists actually encourage children, labeled ADHD, to take stimulants to reduce future dependencies on cocaine and other street drugs. But evidence shows that not only is this theory unfounded, but the reverse is true. When I've spoken to people who are methamphetamine addicts, they said that the drug that they started taking almost consistently was Ritalin. The longer a child is on Ritalin, the more the likelihood that they may become addicted, whether it's Ritalin or Concerta or Adderall, okay, or a number of other drugs. Stimulants aren't the only psychotropic drugs carrying a high potential for addiction. Benzodiazepines, for example, are tranquilizers that can become addictive within 14 days. Take, for example, the benzodiazepine Xanax, which after only five years on the market was producing 1.5 million addicts every year. And getting off can be very difficult. Symptoms of Xanax withdrawal include shakiness, loss of appetite, muscle cramps, memory and concentration problems, insomnia, agitation, panic, and anxiety. Some of the psych medicines, particularly the benzodiazepines, are some of the most addictive drugs there are in terms of the persistent withdrawal anxiety that these drugs cause. I have been in the position of having to withdraw a number of people from benzodiazepines that I didn't put on them, obviously. And it's difficult. It's really difficult. Prescription benzodiazepines, I think, are much more dangerous and much harder to come off of for the patient than the street drugs are. But survivors will tell you that benzodiazepines are not the only class of psychotropic drug that is extremely hard to withdraw from. I had about a 10-year time frame in my life where I abused both street drugs and prescription drugs. And the drugs that were the hardest to come off of, in my opinion, were the psychiatric medications. And I, I mean worse to come off of than, than a drug like heroin. Withdrawal symptoms from the psychiatric drugs just made my mind go crazy. I couldn't think. I couldn't form coherent thoughts whatsoever. I was racing. I had highs and lows, ups and downs, hot and cold sweats. I went through seizures. I, I, I was sweating with night sweats so bad I was, I was wetting my bed just with sweat. I had tremors really bad. I mean, I joked that I looked like I had the end stages of Parkinson's disease, but you couldn't even hold me still when I was going through withdrawals. My legs would shake. I couldn't sleep. No one in the world should have to go through what I went through, in my opinion, and I wouldn't wish it on... I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Even newborns born to women taking psychotropics while pregnant can undergo withdrawal. These infants could experience irritability, hyperactivity, abnormal sleep patterns, vomiting, diarrhea, and failure to gain weight. But it is the amplification of certain side effects caused by withdrawal from psychotropics that can have a disastrous effect on the individual. Now the person stops taking the drug and the effects of the withdrawal or the effects of stop taking the drug are increased and amplified symptoms like the depression or suicide ideas, or etc. They have tremendous mood swings. They even get, they invariably get violent. And they cannot control their emotions. You're very depressed, you're suicidal, you're hallucinating, you're psychotic, you're crazy, any, or you know, you're manic when you stop taking your medication. This is why improper withdrawal from SSRI antidepressants in particular 
has been shown to trigger mood swings and uncontrollable anger, which have been implicated in many recent killing sprees. In May 1998, for example, 15-year-old Kip Kinkle had just stopped taking Prozac when he shot and killed both his parents, then went on a shooting rampage at his Oregon high school where he murdered two more and wounded 25. In November 2007, Pekka Eric Ovenen shot and killed eight at his school north of Helsinki, Finland. Earlier that fall, he had either reduced or stopped using the antidepressant he was prescribed for social anxiety. Valentine's Day 2008, Northern Illinois University, Stephen Kazmierczak walked into a crowded lecture hall and opened fire, killing five and wounding 18. A few weeks earlier, he too had abruptly stopped taking his antidepressant. But rather than acknowledging that tragedies such as these are the result of withdrawal from highly addictive psychotropic drugs, the customary response of psychiatrists is to blame the lack of the drug for what they claim is the return of the mental illness. When a psychiatrist says that, well, the reason why they're feeling that way when they get off the drug is because, see, that shows you how bad they really need the drug. Here's the deal. There's no way that that's true. The reality is when they stop the drug, they get depressed or they get, have withdrawal effects of uh, various types. And the reason they're, they're having those effects is because it's, it's a withdrawal effect from the drug. All you need to do is you need to sit down and listen to anyone who's been on these medications and wants to come off them. And you listen to their story, and you listen to what they're going through, why they want to come off of them. And that's it. The conversation stops. The debate ends. My name is Robin, and currently I am withdrawing from lorazepam, and I am at the point four milligram dose. There we go. Today, I uh, was totally exhausted. I've had four nights, two and that two nights of insomnia, and then a good night's sleep, then two nights of insomnia. I was just hoping that I can sleep better tonight. Didn't sleep good last night. Well, as you can see, today I don't care. I did not get ready and my wave went down. <laughs> I'm down in the valley today. One of the side effects or withdrawal symptoms for lorazepam can be night sweats or hot flashes, a little lightheaded and kind of dizzy, anxiety, sore throat, weepy, very, very tired, grouchy, just overwhelmed, distraught, distressed. I began to experience suicidal thoughts. I've never, I think I've said a little bit to my husband, but he was already worried enough. This is really the first time I'm saying something about it. I feel like I could have a nervous breakdown. You know, there are just times like I hit a brick wall and I just, I can't anymore. It's going to take another, what, maybe 18, 19, 20 weeks to get off of it. And that is very overwhelming to me. I'm weary today. And this is how I used to be for many weeks with lorazepam. And that's the hardest thing is you are trapped into living it out the way you have to live it out in order to be safe. So that's, that's frustrating. I just want my life back. And that's where I am today. It took months for Robin to wean herself off just one of her psychiatric drugs. And addiction specialists agree that slowly withdrawing is the only safe way. You just can't cut people off from these drugs. Sometimes it can take up to a year or more, depending on the person and how long they've been on the drug and how we wean them off. You can't stop these drugs cold turkey. No. I, I would never advise anybody to just stop them. They need to be under the care of a medical practitioner. When some of my patients come in and they talk to me about getting off of the psychiatric medications, I really caution them. Uh, not to just stop their drugs cold turkey because that can really send them into a tailspin. The data is right there. It's going to cause the symptoms that it causes. It's going to have withdrawal effects. 
and they know it. There's not a psychiatrist that doesn't know it. And yet psychiatrists tell us that psychotropic drugs are the only way to keep people from insanity and alleviate mental distress. But is this really the case? Or are there other choices, effective, inexpensive, and drug-free, that could accomplish all the empty promises left broken and unfulfilled by psychiatry? After all that we have seen, should we believe psychiatrists when they claim that just around the corner is their next new breakthrough? And if psychiatry isn't working, where do we go from here? When we look over the landscape, one question becomes clear. How can anyone trust psychiatrists with their mental health? Even psychiatrists interviewed at a recent convention of the American Psychiatric Association readily admit Absolutely. they have no answers. Uh, what is the answer to mental illness? Um, that's too broad of a question to answer. <laughs> What's the answer to mental illness? I don't think there are any answers to mental illness. I got it. That's a, I, I, uh... You still need a better answer than the one we have uh, now for mental illness? I, just, I can't even understand the question. I guess. There's no real answer. You can't. These aren't. These are like chronic problems. You can't just cure somebody. Since psychiatry has no answers, how do we care for those with very real and severe psychological problems? There are, in fact, many, many answers, but you will never hear about them from psychiatrists who prescribe psychotropic drugs. One solution was the Soteria Project, formed in 1971 by Dr. Lauren Mosher, then head schizophrenia researcher at the National Institute of Mental Health. Lauren Mosher uh, developed this program, you know, through NIMH um, to look at this because they were starting to have in the research a debate about whether the medications were actually being helpful or whether they were actually causing some problems. They would create a community-based center where people diagnosed with schizophrenia could go. It was going to be non-drug oriented because he didn't believe that um, psychiatric drugs were the answer to schizophrenia. It provided a place to where there could be people there who would be supportive and um, be there during the time they have a crisis, instead of medicating them, be there with them and help them through it. And the results were staggering. Soteria residents did significantly better than their peers who were on drugs with far fewer readmissions. The success of Soteria House proved that understanding and compassion could relieve mental turmoil far better than psychiatric treatment and without the nasty side effects. But despite this, Dr. Mosher's breakthrough would soon be utterly rejected by a psychiatric community dependent on psychotropic drugs and pharmaceutical money. In Dr. Mosher's 1998 resignation letter to the American Psychiatric Association, he wrote, Psychiatry has been almost completely bought out by the drug companies. We condone and promote the widespread use and misuse of toxic chemicals that we know have serious long-term effects. Is psychiatry a hoax as practiced today? Unfortunately, the answer is mostly yes. When people ask me about why aren't there more places to get this type of treatment and why is biopsychiatry kind of taken over, if they were effective, why did they go away? And, and I really think that it goes back to the question of money. Between political pressure exerted by the psychiatric establishment and a lack of funding, refuges like Soteria are few and far between. But they can be found, and the truly troubled can and do recover. But what about common, everyday mental or emotional distresses, such as depression or mood swings? Without using psychiatry, how can we treat those? It's easier than one might think, since there is ample evidence that well over half of all psychiatric problems are actually caused by an underlying, undetected physical condition. I would say nearly 100% of the time when someone comes in wishing to get off of an antidepressant, 
I find some underlying issues that weren't addressed originally that may have contributed or else caused their mood disorder. And you start to look at all the different factors in their life, a lot of times you can find that there, there's multiple different reasons that someone's not feeling well. Viruses can cause depression. Uh, digestive issues can cause depression and anxiety. Iron deficiency is very connected to depression. One of the effects of pesticide poisoning is depression. Little children, if they get a streptococcal infection, uh, can become obsessive and compulsive. I've seen people with bipolar disorder, manic depression who have food allergies. Pretty much any kind of psychiatric problem can be associated with a low thyroid state. A ton of difficulties that a person has that can manifest itself as a supposed mental illness, but you fix the hormone, you fix the gland, you fix the nutrition. Miraculously, you can also fix the quote unquote mental illness. Why a psychiatrist cannot get to the root of a person's problem, that, that's the million dollar question. I have absolutely no idea. They could, they learn it in school, they could just as easily run a blood test as I could run a blood test. They could run all the diagnostic tests. I can, they study anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology. They just choose on their own to treat symptoms. What about others whose psychological problem is not due to an underlying physical problem? Divorcing parents, a change in babysitters, moving in the middle of a school year. Those can cause disruptions in the normal flow of sitting in a class and paying attention. Good things are seen as stressful as bad things. Buying a house can be as stressful as losing a house. Getting married can be as stressful as getting divorced. But it may be some situational anxiety, situational depression that would have resolved on its own years ago. And, and the patient's been on medicine for years. It is ridiculous to think that uh, normal depression or grief from normal life circumstances should be treated with medication. We didn't think this way before we had them because people just took it for granted that life was difficult at times. It was stressful, painful, and, you know, difficult emotions, be they anger, pain, um, sadness, grief. All these things are normal reactions, and to cover that up with medication is really to um, turn your back on what makes us human beings, which is our emotions. Of course, serious mental problems do, at times, require the assistance of others. But because of the massive money power of pharmaceutical companies that keeps paid psychiatrists propped up in positions of influence over the public, the media, and the rest of the medical field, the only treatment you will ever hear of is psychotropic drugs. But there is one thing the consumer can do. Insist on full and accurate informed consent. Informed consent boils down to the patient must be told uh, about their diagnosis and what the risks and benefits and alternatives are to the treatment. Risks and benefits and alternatives to the treatment, risks, benefits, and alternatives to not treatment. So what are the key points of informed consent when it comes to psychotropic drugs? One, psychiatric disorders are not actual diseases requiring medical treatment. Two, there is no scientific proof that psychiatric drugs resolve or cure any mental problems. Three, psychiatric drugs mask symptoms and come with severe short and long-term side effects. Four, psychiatric drugs can cause dependency and addiction. Five, most mental problems are caused by an underlying physical illness. Six, no matter how severe the emotional or psychological distress, there are many effective options that do not involve psychiatric drugs. Unfortunately, these points are rarely told to patients. I have over 2,000 clients, and I can honestly say 100% of them that have come to me, it has either been suggested that they take psychiatric drugs or they actually have taken them. And probably 70 to 80% have actually fallen into the trap and taken the psychiatric drugs because they didn't know what else to do. 50% of patients who are not treated for depression come out of it on their own without any therapy. Okay, that's never on an informed consent, but it is a fact. So there's never a full informed consent. But the truth is coming out. 14 U.S. state laws now severely restrict the psychiatric labeling and drugging of children. 
and a 2004 federal law prohibits school personnel from forcing parents to medicate their sons or daughters with psychotropics. Meanwhile, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration has slapped their black box warning label on antidepressants for suicide in children and teenagers, and another warning on stimulants for heart attack, stroke, and sudden death in people of all ages. On another front, psychiatric survivors are now successfully pursuing legal remedies for the crippling effects of psychotropic drugs. Since 2005, there have been 50,000 individual product liability and personal injury lawsuits filed against drug companies for damage caused by psychotropic drugs, an average of 34 suits a day. Eli Lilly, accused of illegally marketing its antipsychotic Zyprexa, has paid out more than two and a half billion dollars in settlements to 34 states and 31,000 plaintiffs. In 2009, drug maker Pfizer agreed to forfeit over $2.3 billion, in part for colluding with a psychiatric front group to illegally market its antipsychotic, Geodon. Yet with yearly pharmaceutical revenues around $600 billion, drug companies treat judgments and penalties as just a cost of doing business. In fact, billions have been set aside in advance for just that purpose. The pharmaceutical industry has such a huge uh, financial base that even hundreds of millions of dollars in fines is basically meaningless to them. Fines for some of these transgressions are like petty cash to the big companies. They're more concerned about the, uh, the uh, reputation that might be damaged by this. The main thing they do there is just try to hide the fact, and the quickest way to hide the fact is to quickly pay the fine and get out of town. And this opens the door to enterprising attorneys, but they have to be prepared. Lawyers need to understand that they do not receive adequate scientific training to conduct these cases by themselves. They need to gather together a team of experts who will help them to do these cases wisely and well. And then other people will begin to see the rates of uh, success that we have had over the last 12 years doing what I call science-intensive litigation. You have to go to the experts in the field and say, okay, you know, uh, bring your expertise to bear, come to court and tell people what you know. I have found that there's an overwhelming number of people that when they, they see the atrocities that have occurred, with psychiatry and the way people have been treated, they are very willing to come over and testify against psychiatry and testify against techniques that are being used. The court system is just one area where people are speaking out. You too can help by sharing this documentary with coworkers, clients, patients, friends, and loved ones.